محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ينفعنا اللهم فقنا في الدين وعلمنا التأويل اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه We thank Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala for the constant blessings that he bestows upon us regularly. And we thank him Tabarak wa Ta'ala for everything that he has given us. Allah Azza wa Jal he mentions in the Quran regarding the early believers. He says yamunnuna alayka an aslam قُلْ لَا تَمُنُّوا عَلَيَّ إِسْلَامَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ أَنْ هَدَاكُمْ لِلْإِيمَانِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ They say to the Prophet وسلم, regarding their faith and the fact that they accepted as Islam as them doing a favor for the Prophet so Allah tells the Prophet to respond to them. O Prophet of Allah, do you not regard your Islam or tell them, do not regard your Islam to be a favor for me? You're not doing a service by being a Muslim and having faith in Allah wa ta'ala. You're not doing a service for the Prophet, nor are you doing a service for Allah Azza wa Jal. Rather, it is Allah who has done a service for you. بَلِ اللَّهُ يَمُنُّ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah has favored you and blessed you by giving you this guidance. If you indeed were once to be faithful. So the blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal gave us in faith and guidance is one, Wallahi, you, we can never ascribe to any amount. Right? We see the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he's talking to Ali radiallahu anhu. لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرِ النِّعَمِ That if one person were to be guided to Al-Islam because of you, and you were the source of their guidance, that's better for you than you know, a red camel, or a camel that's fat and red. And to them, that was the best that they had. To us, it's like a Bugatti or a Maybach or whatever car that, it's really expensive. Right. And, and that's the case if you were to guide someone to Islam. But Allah Azza wa Jal already favored you to be Muslim. Right. So the Prophet ﷺ gave me the parable that if you were to do that, then having this fancy thing, right. that, that action that you did is better, right. is worth more than having that fancy thing, or having that car, whatever it may be. And Allah Azza wa Jal has already blessed us with His faith. He already blessed us with this guidance. So it's really incumbent that we thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for it. This guidance that we are blessed with, I want to look at it from one angle. We have the salah. The salah, we could say, is one of the most important actions a believer can do. Right? And the salah itself has many virtues. Right? The salah that we pray five times a day, it's the only action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the heavens. And he directly gave him the commandment to pray salah. Generally, the other commandments, Jibreel would come to him in the form of Qur'an. And he would give him the commandment. However, Allah specialized this action. And he took him to the heavens. And he spoke to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he gave him the commandment of the five daily prayers. Important. We recognize the salah is important. We know the difference between us and those that don't believe in Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, as the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tells us, is the salah. Al-ahdu baynana wa baynahum, as-salah. The difference between us and them is that prayer that we pray five times a day. Uh, we recognize that the salah is the best action that we can do. As the Prophet ﷺ was asked, 
What is the best action I can do? And the first response in this specific hadith was As-salatu ala waqtiha Praying the prayer at its prescribed time From the virtues of salah is that it expiates sins Why am I mentioning all this? I'm going to get to it Just follow me inshallah The salah, it expiates sins As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He gave the parable Right, he gave the example of someone that were to live right beside a river. Right. He were to live right beside a river. And he were to take a bath five times a day. Would that person have any filth on them? Of course not. Right. And the same thing, the companions responded to the Prophet Right. They, they said to him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, قَالُوا لَا يُبْقَى مِن دَرَرِهِ شَيْءٍ there's not going to be any filth, O Prophet of Allah, at all on that person. They're taking a bath five times a day. Right? Uh, so they said there wouldn't be any filth on this person. قَالَ فَذَلِكَ مِثْلُ الصَّلَوَاتِ الْخَمْسِ يَمْحُوا اللَّهُ بِهِ خَطَايَا Oh, يَمْحُوا اللَّهُ بِهِ الْخَطَايَا It's the same way. Right? The same way that someone were to take a bath five times a day, if they were to live beside a river, that same way, the five daily prayers, they expiate the sins of a person. And we also recognize that the salah from its virtues is that on the day of judgment, Allah Azza wa would cause it to be a light for that person. Prophet says in the hadith that whoever safeguards man hafadha alayha kanat lahu nooran wa burhanan wa najatan yawm al qiyamah. You safeguard that prayer, you make sure you pray it on its times or at its times. Then Allah Azza wa will give you light. He will allow it to be a guidance for you and a guide. Burhanan. And it will be that thing that hopefully, inshallah, will save us on the day. Munajat and Yawm al Qiyamah. So, definitely, salah has many virtues. Within this salah, within this amazing salah that we've been talking about, and all the virtues that we spoke about it, within this salah, there is a passage. That we have to recite every single raka'ah that we pray salah. Every raka'ah that we pray, we have to recite this passage in prayer. And that passage, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that it is the best passage that was revealed to anybody, to any nation and any group that was the best passage Revealed. The hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He narrates the story of Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Ubay ibn Ka'ab, one of the uh, great Sahaba, and one the Sahaba known to uh, be from the ulama of the Quran. Right? They used to be, he used to be very connected uh, to the Quran, and he was known, he was known for his recitation uh, and his knowledge of the Quran. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, تحب أن أعلمك سورة لم ينزل في التوراة ولا في الإنجيل ولا في الزبور ولا في الفرقان مثلها. Oh, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, do you should I tell you a passage, any surah that was not revealed in the Torah, that which was revealed to Musa عليه السلام, the Injil, that which was revealed to Isa عليه السلام. The Zabur, the book that was revealed to Dawood alayhi salam. And the Furqan, this Qur'an that we have. It is the best passage that was revealed. And of course, Ubrahim Ka'ab, you know, the Sahaba, was, the Sahaba was, were always eager to know. They were always eager uh, to seek knowledge. So he answers with the affirmative. He says, Naam, qala naam. And he asks him, yeah, ma ya Rasulullah, what is it? And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responds to him. And he says, كَيْفَ تَقْرَأُ فِي الصَّلَاةِ What do you recite in the salah? Right. So, and he responds to him, فَقَالْ فَأَقْرَأُ أُمُّ الْقُرْآنِ I recite the mother of the Qur'an. And we all know the mother of the Qur'an is one of the names of Surah Al-Fatiha. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ مَا أُنزِلَتْ فِي التَّوْرَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ وَلَا فِي الزَّبُورِ وَلَا فِي الْفُرْقَانِ مِثْلَهَا وَإِنَّهَا سَبْعٌ مِنَ الْمَثَانِ وَالْقُرْآنِ الَّذِي أُعْطِيتَهُ 
Allahu Akbar. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responds that this passage is the is a passage that was revealed. Or he says, Walladhi nafsi biyadi. Walladhi nafsi biyadi. By the one in whose soul is my hand. Or the one in whose hand is my soul. The like of it has never been revealed in the Torah, nor in the Injil, nor in the Zibur, nor in the Quran. Meaning, when the Prophet says meaning in the Quran, that there's nothing similar to it even within the Quran. Even in the Quran, all of it's virtuous. There's nothing similar to Al-Fatiha. And the Prophet Sallallahu he, he gives now a description of this Quran. إِنَّهَا سَبْعٌ مِنَ الْمَثَانِي It is the seven often repeated ayat. وَإِنَّهُ سَبْعٌ مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ And the magnificent Quran. These are characteristics of this Fatiha. وَالْقُرْآنِ الْعَظِيمِ الَّذِي عُطِيتَهُ That I was given. Within this surah, we recite it in the best action, which is as-salah, or one of the best actions, which is as-salah. The passage itself is the best passage that was revealed to mankind. The best passage that was revealed to mankind. And we recite that passage 17 times at a minimum per day. And within that passage, we make one dua. It's seven ayat. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We mention some of the attributes of Allah azza wa jal. And we make one single dua. Have you ever pondered about why we make that dua so often? We say, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Oh Allah, guide us to the straight path. And we keep on repeating it. And we repeat it day after day. Has it ever come to us why we repeat specifically this passage and why we repeat that dua often? Inshallah, the goal is to uh, really look at that ayah, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And this guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to ask Him 17 times at a minimum a day, why we ask Him it so often. And what inshallah uh, the secret is. All these points that I mentioned, the salah, the fatiha, the fact that we recite this uh, passage so many times a day, all of it really allows us to recognize to recognize the importance of guidance or this guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us with. However, the reality, it's not just about recognition of guidance. It's one thing to know that it's important. We mentioned why, you know, guidance is important. And we uh, connected it with some really important things. So recognition alone is not enough. Just to know that this is important in your life, is it enough? Uh, but it's about really internalizing that blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. Feeling that blessing. Cultivating it. Growing it within you. And fearing that you don't lose that gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you. In the dunya, we work so hard for things. And it can be so many. We work hard when it comes to business. When it comes to our careers and schooling. When it comes to found, finding the right spouse and getting married. And once we grasp that blessing of Allah Taala, wa ta'ala, we recognize that all these are blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal. Once we get a hold of it and we grasp it and we have it in our possession, we fear to lose it. We never want to lose money. You don't want your business to crash. You never want to fail in your studies. You never want to have a divorce. These are things that you work so hard for in life. And if someone were to lose them, right, some people, when they lose some of these things, you see them and they become delirious. You think they might be insane and might be going crazy. And they lose their senses. May Allah protect us. And the reason is that these things mean so much to them. And they work so hard to get it. And for that reason, they make sure that they protect it. And they don't lose it. 
Similarly, ikhwani wa akhawati, my brothers and sisters, guidance and faith, and this faith that Allah wa ta'ala blessed us with is a blessing just like those as well. Right? However, there are certain people that reach a level and the recognition of faith and iman, and they taste, right? And we're going to get to it. Tasting faith, tasting iman. They reach a level where they don't want to lose it. Why, why am I saying this? I talked about things in the dunya. We never want to lose them. Have we, has it ever come to mind, ever fearing the loss of faith? When something's important, the point I'm trying to make is when something's important to you and has value, you make sure that you protect it with every ability that you have. You make sure that you grow it and cultivate it and you take care of it. And you work hard for it initially. Or and when you have it, you protect it and you let it grow. And you increase in it. So has it come to us a time where we fear ever losing this beauty of faith? So the concept is when we feel Iman, or the point is when we feel Iman and we recognize its importance. Again, I said it's not just recognition, but it's when you really taste it and you grasp it and you, you feel it, that's when you really fear uh, to lose it. And that's a, really the true attainment of faith. It's not just to know that you're Muslim. It's not just to bow up and down, right, five times a day and then run to what some of us might think is more important, which is our jobs and the dunya. Not saying, again, that's not important. Right? But there, there are always priorities. And it's a point of reflection for all of us to sit down and really think. And I think a lot of us, we don't want that. We don't want to face the reality to sit and really reflect on our lives and the different aspects of our lives. But when you sit and you think, what really matters to me the most? Right. And you reflect, and sometimes you might write that down. Right. If Islam and faith is not on the top of your list, then you really need to revisit your Islam. You really need to revisit what it is to be a Muslim. You really need to now educate yourself as to what Islam really, really and truly is. And the reality, my brother and sister, is it might be the case that you've never really tasted faith and that's why it might not matter to you. Right. And we're going to get to uh, tasting faith a little later on, inshallah. And that's why those that were well grounded in knowledge, those that were well versed, these scholars that Allah mentions within the Quran, they're well grounded. Their roots in knowledge are well grounded. They're scholars. What did they ask Allah Azza wa Jalla? First, they affirmed that they believed in Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. They said they believe in this Quran. And they recognize it's from Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. And that all of it, the muhkam and the mutashabih of it is from Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah says, وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ يَقُولُونَ آمَنَّا بِهِ كُلٌّ مِّنْ عِنْدِ رَبِّنَا all of it, the entire Qur'an is from Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَا يَذَّكَّرُ إِلَّا أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ But none will be mindful of this except people of reason. Those who have intellect will really recognize that all of this is from Allah Azza wa Jal. Our main point is the dua that they make. رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِغْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ Before I translate this ayah, there are certain ad'iyah that we recite. We all make du'a. Right? And there's du'as that we've learned when we're young. Right? And we know them from the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Or they might be ad'iyah or different du'as that are within the Qur'an. And making and supplicating and using those du'as are fantastic. Right? To recognize, to know that this is a du'a from the Qur'an and the sunnah and that they are one of the best du'as to make because some of them, the prophets made it. That's amazing. That's fantastic. That's a good step. But to really analyze why these great people are making these type of ad'iyah and what's so special about making this dua is something else. And that really 
gives you the understanding why they're making this dua. And why whatever is in this dua is so important that they're asking Allah for it or they're asking Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala to keep them away from it. Or they're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to not lose what they already have. Right, so to deep dive in these du'as and look at them, what, what, what's being presented here? So Allah says, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِلْ قُلُوبَنَا They say, Oh Allah, don't deviate our hearts. After you have given us guidance, بَعْدَ إِذْ هَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبَ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً And grant us, Oh Allah, from your mercy. إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَابِ Indeed, O oh Allah Azza wa Jal, you are the giver of all bounties. They use the attribute of Allah and the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, Al-Wahhab, the one that gives bounties. So they recognize that the faith that Allah blessed them with and the guidance that they have, they don't want to lose it. And they never want to face that atrocity and that calamity of ever losing their faith. So they ask and they supplicate to Allah Azza wa Jalla, Oh Allah, don't deviate our hearts from this beautiful bounty that you gave us and don't allow us to lose it. Don't ever, Oh Allah, and we ask you and we are begging you, don't allow us to ever, or don't ever allow us to deviate from this path. Don't allow us, Oh Allah, to lose our faith. Because it means something to them. It's important to them. And that's the main point here. It is this same guidance and this same faith in the face of doubts, in the face of doubters, one prevails and they triumph over that trial. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentions the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, where He used the celestial bodies the sun, the moon, the stars, to prove to his people that Allah Azza wa Jal is the only true God. So he's trying to really argue and debate with his people to prove to them that Allah Azza wa Jal should be the only one that deserves their worship. And that these creations of Allah Azza wa Jal shouldn't have any portion of worship. And at the end of the passage, at the end of the story, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions the statement of Ibrahim alayhi salam. إِنِّي وَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِيَ لِلَّذِي فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَحَاجَّهُ قَوْمُهُ قَالَ أَتُحَاجُّونِي فِي اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانِ He mentions that he turns his face towards Allah Azza wa Jal. The one who has originated the heavens and the earth. Being upright. Hanifan, one that is upright upon the path of Tawheed. And I'm not one that's going to be, or I'm not one of the polytheists. I t he's telling his people that I'm not one that does shirk. I don't associate partners with Allah Azza wa Jal. What I'm upon is the truth. And then Allah says, وَحَاجَّهُ قَوْمُ And his people argued with him. And that was the prior portion or the prior passage to this which he, would, he was arguing with his people. And he responded to them, Are you arguing with me about Allah Azza wa Jal? Why he has guided me? The point here is, he's in a state where, or he's in a community, where no one believes in Allah Azza wa Jal. Or the majority of the people there, they don't believe in him. He doesn't have anybody to protect him against them. And, we, and Allah tells us about his story and how they threw him in the fire. And how it was Allah Azza wa Jal that saved him. And he said to the fire, قُلْنَا يَا نَارُ كُونِي بَغْدًا وَسَلَامًا عَلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمٌ وَأَرَادُوا بِهِ كَيْدًا فَجَعَلْنَاهُمُ الْأَخْسَرِينَ وَأَسْفَرِينَ That they wanted evil for him. But it was Allah Azza wa Jal that deviated that evil from him. And they indeed were the ones to be the low ones or the losers. So he was in a community that didn't believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. They didn't testify faith. However, however, his response to them with certainty and conviction was, you're arguing with me when Allah Azza wa Jal blessed me with this guidance? 
Allah guided me already. I'm certain about what I have. I already know what you're upon is false. So don't argue with me. Again, he reached the level of certainty where no matter what type of doubts were presented to him, it didn't matter. His heart was filled with the iman of Allah. His heart was filled with the conviction and the faith that Allah and the guidance that Allah Azza wa gave him. So his response was that. Are you going to argue with me? And Allah Azza wa guided me. Atuhajuni fi Allah wa qad ahadan. So it is that guidance that keeps up one, someone upright, whatever doubt that may come their way. Whatever doubt those that are trying to stir up, face, or, or bring about, you prevail it with this guidance that Allah blesses people with. It is that same faith and that same guidance. In the face of trial, one stands strong. And Allah Azza wa tells us the story of Musa alayhi salam. And of course, Musa's story is the one that's often repeated in the Quran. And of course, there's a purpose. In certain areas, Allah Azza wa summarizes the story. In certain areas, Allah Azza wa really dives into the details of the story. And in this case, Allah Azza wa really tells us the story. Qala bal alqu, he tells us, Azza wa And prior to this, we know that Fir'aun, being the tyrant that he was, there was the decision now to gather all the people together and have a showdown between the sorcerers and the magicians and Musa and Harun alayhim as -salam. Everybody is going to be present. There's no room for failure. If Musa fails at this junction, then khalas. His message has ended. Everyone's going to take him as a joke. There's no coming back. Right. He has to win. He has to be the one that's on top in this case. So everyone's there. You have a huge audience. You have the opportunity to now call these people to Allah Azza wa Jal. So Allah tells the story. قَالَ بَلْ أَلْقُوا So who's going to go first? And Musa alayhi salam and Hawa tell them, you go first. To the magicians. قَالَ بَلْ أَلْقُوا فَإِذَا حِبَالُهُمْ وَعِصِيُّهُمْ يُخَيَّلُوا إِلَيْهِ مِنْ سِحْرِهِمْ أَنَّهَا تَسْعَى that when they throw, when they threw their, their ropes and their staffs and their sticks, it was perceived to them and made to them that they were slithering snakes. So to the eye, again they're magicians. To the eye, it looked that like they were snakes. Yeah, Allah uses the word yuhayyal ulay. It was made to them or made to seem that they were slithering. And it's at that point where Musa alayhi salam got frightened. فَأَوْجَسَ فِي نَفْسِهِ خِيفَةً مُوسَى Musa was concealed with fear. Musa actually got scared. And then Allah Azza wa Jal really gives him that comfort at this time. He says, قُلْنَا لَا تَخَفْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْأَعْلَى He needs that comfort at that time. He's scared. He's in front of Fir'aun, the tyrant that everyone knows. In front of all these people, Allah comforts him and says, "Qunna la taqaf inna ka anta alaa." Gives him reassurance. Do not fear. It is certainly you who will prevail. You're going to be the one that wins. Those that are with Allah Tabarak wa Taala are always going to prevail. Those that are with Allah Azza wa Jal will always prevail. وَالْقِيَ مَا فِي يَمِينِكَ تَلْقَفْ مَا صَنَعُوا إِنَّمَا صَنَعُوا كَيْدُ سَاحِرٍ وَلَا يُفْلِحُ السَّاحِرُ حَيْثُ أَتَى Then Allah Azza wa Jal commands him to uh, to cast and throw that which is in his hand, his right hand, and that what's to come out and the snake that's to come out is going to swallow up all these things that they they threw. تلقف ما صنعوا. It's gonna swallow. تلقف ما صنعوا. إنما صنعوا كيد ساحر. That which they they casted was just a magic trick. ولا يفلح الساحر حيث أتى. And the magicians will never succeed in whatever at whatever they go or wherever they go. Wherever they go, those who are displeasing to Allah تبارك وتعالى will never succeed. فأ فألقي السحرة سجدا. 
They're sorcerers. They know magic. They know what's with Musa alayhi salam wasn't magic. And that's, subhanAllah, ikhwani, the difference when someone recognizes iman. Right? And this is the whole point that we're talking about faith and guidance. They recognized the khas. The sign of Allah Azza wa came to them and they had to believe in Allah. At this junction, there was no way that they couldn't believe in Allah Azza wa The clear sign has come to them. If they didn't believe in Allah Azza wa at that moment, then when would they believe? So what did they do? فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحْرَةُ سُجَّدًا They all prostrated to Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى They said, we believe in the Lord of Musa and Harun. قَالَ آمَنْتُمْ لَهُ قَبَلَ أَنْ آذَنَ لَكُمْ And Allah continues uh, the story. Where Fir'aun now turns to the magicians. He didn't expect this. He didn't expect Musa to win in this case. Right? These magicians that he pays and they're on his payroll and they're on his side. He didn't expect them to lose. So now he turns to them, the magicians. They now have prostrated in front of everybody and believed in Allah. We have to recognize that these magicians are at the top hierarchy of their community. They're the right hand men of Fir'aun. So it's a blow to Fir'aun. So now he has to, you know, turn to them and try to scare them. Now Fir'aun starts to threaten them. How dare you believe in him before I gave you the order? How, do, how can you believe in this creator that Musa is calling you to? And I didn't give you that command. Again, we know Fir'aun thought he was Lord. Right? So how can you believe in this when I didn't give you permission? And then he correlates this magic with Musa alayhi salam. He calls Musa al-kabir. He's the master sorcerer that taught you this. Now the threat comes. And mentions that he's going to cut their hands off. Cut their hands and their feet on opposite sides. And he's going to crucify them on the trunks of palm trees. And then he says, you will really see whose punish is, punishment is more severe and everlasting. Again, Musa, uh, Fir'aun, was well known for this. He was well known for his, his punishments. So for the, these magicians to believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, they're giving up a lot. They're giving up a lot. And subhanAllah, the response is one for every believer to really ponder and look at. قَالُوا لَن نُؤْثِرَكَ عَلَى مَا جَاءَنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَالَّذِي فَطَرَنَا فَقْضِ مَا أَن تَقَاضِ إِنَّمَا تَقْضِ هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا إِنَّا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّنَا لِيَغْفِرَ لَنَا خَطَايَنَا وَمَا أَكْرَهْتَنَا عَلَيْهِ مِنَ السِّحْرِ But they respond that by the one who created us, now they believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. So by the one who created us, you will never or we will never prefer you over the clear proofs that have come to us. And the one that has created us. Fir'aun, you have the capability of killing us? You have the capability of torturing us? Do it. Do as you want. Your authority only covers this fleeting dunya. They recognize that the dunya didn't mean as much. Right? Iman entered their hearts completely, full throttle, in one moment. SubhanAllah. And in this you know, junction in the Quran, and this story in the Quran, is one of the most amazing passages. They never prayed before. They never believed in Allah Azza wa Jal. They never used to pray at night. They never used to fast. But when they were, when they believed in Allah Tabarak wa Taala, their belief was complete. So much so that they can tell this tyrant that was known for his persecution, that was known for his tyrancy, that was known for these atrocities that he caused to his people, that was known for all of this, they could tell him, "Do as you please. We believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. We're not going to turn away from this beauty that Allah gave us. 
We're not going to turn away from this guidance and this faith. We believe in Him and Him alone. So do as you please. You may possess something, but your possession and your authority is only in this dunya. And you can only harm us now. You can only harm us now. So, uh, you know, this, this passage is really symbolic in the sense that someone cannot really, someone might not do the greatest actions. Right? But when they believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, and Iman had entered their heart in the beginning, it can enter their hearts and it can really engulf them to the point where they can say these type of statements in the face of such a difficult position and such a difficult scene. It's this guidance and this faith that Allah Azza wa Jal bests us with, which is the Jannah in the world. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, uh, he has a, a beautiful statement where he says, Inna fi dunya Jannah. That in, in the world, in the world, Allah placed within it a paradise. مَن لَمْ يَدْخُلْهَا لَمْ يَدْخُلْ جَنَّةَ الْآخِرَةِ That whoever doesn't enter into this paradise, doesn't enter into the paradise of the hereafter. So they ask him, قَالُوا وَمَا هِيَ What is this Jannah that you're talking about? قَالَ إِنَّهَا جَنَّةُ الْإِيمَانِ The Jannah is faith. When faith gets to a point, my brother and sister, where you're, you're happy with it, it's, it's spread through all your limbs and it has taken over your heart. And that faith, the Prophet wasallam, or I should say before that, Allah Azza wa Jal talks about that faith as well in the Quran. When he says, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَىٰ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحِيَّنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That Allah talks about a category of people. That those people that do righteous actions, and they can be from the male gender and the female gender. It doesn't matter. They can, be, they can be from the male sex and the female sex. It doesn't matter what sex they're from, male or female. mu'min, And they have belief in Allah wa ta'ala. What does is, what is Allah Azza wa Jal reward them with? Before the Akhirah, what does He reward them with? He rewards them, as Allah says, a good life. He allows them to live in a good life. The scholars mention almost nine interpretations of what a good life is. And one of them is the beauty of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the beauty of worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. And the beauty of faith and the beauty of guidance. It's that beauty that Allah Azza wa Jal, He gives to people. And He blesses them with. And then Allah says, وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And that Allah Azza wa Jal will certainly reward them according to the best of their deeds. So He gives them in the dunya, and he also uh, promises them in the Akhirah. And, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam talking about that sweetness of faith. He says, أَذَاكَ طَعْمُ الْإِيمَانِ أَذَاكَ طَعْمُ الْإِيمَانِ مَنْ رَضِيَ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّنِ وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَبِمُحَمَّدٍ نَبِيًّا That one has truly tasted the sweetness of faith. The one who is pleased that Allah is their Lord. They're pleased that Islam is their religion and they're pleased that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is their Prophet. That the attainment of the sweetness of faith that we see Ibrahim Alayhi Salam illustrate and we see the sorcerers at the time of Fir'aun illustrate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he gives us the formula. It's the one that's pleased with Allah Azza wa Jal. How do you become pleased with Allah if we don't know Him? If we don't know His names and we don't know anything about His attributes, Jalla Jalaluhu. We've never pondered the Quran that Allah Azza wa Jal sent, us, sent to us as a manual and a guide. We never opened the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that Allah told us is the best 
of mankind and the one that's supposed to be our the best role model. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا And the Prophet ﷺ before you is the best example. But we don't know him. We don't know the different trials that the Prophet ﷺ had to face in his life. And the ways that he overcame them with the aid of Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't know anything about him. We don't know anything about our deen, quite frankly. But we expect that Iman reaches to the depths of our fingertips and to the depths of our hearts without recognizing these fundamental aspects of our religion. And of course, Iman is not just a recognition that we, as we've been talking about. It's deeper than that. It's a feeling. But that feeling also transcends to the body. When the person tastes that faith, they show it in their limbs. And that we see from the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ himself. Right? When he prayed at night, so much so as so much so. So the Prophet ﷺ, he prayed at night, so much so that his heels were swollen. And in another narration, they burst. In the sense that they, they were cracking. The Prophet ﷺ was standing so long. And you can only imagine again, how long he's standing for that to happen to him? How long would he be standing for his feet to swell up and to crack? And when Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked him, and she said, Oh Prophet of Allah, why are you doing this? You've been forgiven for your future sins and those that were, that were past. Even though the Prophet ﷺ is free of sin. So Allah already forgave you. Why are you doing all this? Why do you have to pray so much? So the concept for them was, Allah gave you the blessing. You should now be able to relax. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, أَفَلَا أَكُونَ عَبَدًا شُكُورًا Shouldn't I be one that's thankful? Shouldn't I be a slave that's thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal? It's as if the Prophet ﷺ is saying, and Allah knows best. But it's as if the Prophet ﷺ is saying, because Allah Azza wa Jal blessed me, because Allah blessed me with this that I have, I should be one that's thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's because Allah blessed us with the faith and blessed us with iman and blessed us with guidance and steadfastness that we should thank Him and we thank Him by worshipping Him and singing Him out in worship and trying our best to build the relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal through the different acts of worship that He commanded Azza wa Jal. I think uh, my time's almost done. Inshallah, I mentioned a few points before uh, we conclude Inshallah. Uh, but it's this guidance or this guidance that we're talking about in itself is a blessing. The recognition and fear of losing it, so us recognizing it and protecting this blessing or protecting this guidance in itself is a blessing. Again, the guidance that you have in itself is a blessing. The recognition and the fear of losing it in itself is a blessing. The steadfastness that this guidance gives you in front of doubts and desires and trials in itself is a blessing. And the thinking of Allah Azza wa Jal when He gives you this guidance is a blessing. And Allah gave us many, of course, many different types of blessings. And all of them were supposed to thank Allah Azza wa Jal. And those, you know, thanking Allah is not simple sometimes. Right? And it's, 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 a, great, it's a great deed to thank Allah Azza wa Jal is great. Right? But to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for the blessing of guidance is on another level. And we see the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he talks about that Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with the, with the one. Inna Allah la yarda. 
That Allah Azza wa is pleased with the servant, the servant. That when they eat, you know, a, a food, when they eat a meal, whatever meal that may be, dinner, lunch, whatever meal that is, when they eat that meal, that they thank him. That Allah Azza wa is pleased with that servant. When they come with thanks for that meal that Allah Azza wa provides them. So of course, thanking Allah Azza wa for such minute, again, we can call it minute, but again, there are blessings, right? And some people don't have those blessings, reality, right? Uh, so thanking Allah Azza wa for those blessings is great, definitely, it's great. And uh, we see in this hadith that Allah Azza wa is pleased with the one that thanks him for the food that he gives him and the drink that he gives him. But thanking Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala for the guidance that he blessed you is different and we see that from uh, the Prophet uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And we see uh, some of the, uh, the sayings of the scholars and I'm going to conclude inshallah uh, with that. The saying of Ibrahim ibn Adham. Right, him and another man, uh, they were on you know, the riverbank. And Ibrahim ibn Adham, from the Salaf, he was really poor. He didn't have much. And the scene is that he was so poor that he had slices of bread and pieces of bread and he would dip it in water just to get it soft enough to be able to swallow it. Right? Many of us, we've never ever felt that type of hunger or that we've never felt that type of situation in our lifetime. Our fridge is always full. There's probably never a time that you ever really felt hungry, maybe besides Ramadan, right? When you're fasting. But there's never a time that you really felt hungry and you didn't have food. Right? And this Salaf, he doesn't have anything. All he has is pieces of bread and he's dipping it in water, just enough to swallow it and give him some type of nutrition. So he tells his fellow, uh, you know, uh, uh, his fellow companion, he tells him, لو علم الملوك وأبناء الملوك ما نحن فيها لجال دون بالسيوف. That if the kings and the son of the kings were to recognize that which we are enjoying right now, they would have fought us with their swords. Me and you, when we look at this, we would be confused. Ya Habibi, you don't have anything. You're starving. How could you be so happy? Right. How can you be rejoicing if you're at the bottom of, again, our recognition of status? You don't have anything. You don't have anything to show for it in terms of dunya. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the dunya. He's talking about iman. He's talking about knowledge. And he's talking about the guidance that Allah Azza wa blessed him with. And if they were to recognize these kings and those who are fortunate, if they were to recognize the blessing that Allah Azza wa gave him, Wallahi, they would have fought him. And again, it's not just, and I'm going to conclude with that, it's not just recognition. Right? Recognizing, he recognized the blessing, but he wouldn't say such a statement if it wasn't only just knowing that he had, or knowing the, the, or having the knowledge that faith and guidance is important. That statement wouldn't have come out of him. But what made him say that type of statement was Iman was here. He actually, wallahi, and we hope, we can't say he did, but we hope that he tasted faith. And that, that taste of faith allowed him to say this type of statement in some of the most trialing times that anybody can face. Right. So, if I were to sum, sum up everything that I was saying for the last hour and 15 minutes, it is faith and guidance is the greatest blessing that Allah Azza wa has given us. And it's that blessing that in the Akhirah, the people of Jannah will recognize it too. Imagine, and we ask Allah wa ta'ala for His favor and we ask Him for Jannah. People are in paradise. They're rejoicing. They've made it. You finally got to paradise. After all the trials of the dunya, you faced everything that you can face in the dunya. 
You got to the Akhirah. You passed the Sirat. You seen hellfire and it's roaring and it's screaming at you and it's being pulled back by angels. You faced everything and you got to the finish line. Alhamdulillah, you got to the finish line. You got to the finish line. And they think Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. For what? Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. They think Allah azza wa jal for guiding them to this. The path that led them to get to paradise. They thank Him for that. So they recognize that this path that they were on initially would have led them there. And for that reason, once they get to their destination, they recognize that that was the greatest favor that Allah gave them. Alhamdulillah. الَّذِي هَدَانَا لِهَذَا وَمَا كُنَّا لِنَهْتَدِيَ لَوْلَا أَنْ هَدَانَ اللَّهِ And they recognize that it's a favor from Allah Azza wa Jal. And they thank Him for it. So we ask Allah wa ta'ala, uh, to be from, um, from amongst those. We ask Allah wa ta'ala, to really allow us to taste uh, the taste of faith that Allah Azza wa Jal and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they mention in the Quran. We ask Allah wa ta'ala, to protect us. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, to protect us from any doubts and any type of uh, anything that will uh, turn us away from his deen. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfuka wa atu. نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأصلح لنا شأننا كله ولا تكلنا إلى أنفسنا طرفة عين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد I want to begin my talk uh, by first saying جزاك الله خير everyone for coming I ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to make this conference a special, a blessed, and a beneficial one. Allahumma ameen. I also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put it in our mawazin hasanat on the day of judgment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all the brothers and sisters and everyone who partook in or organizing this beautiful conference. Inshallah ta'ala, um, my topic is about, as it was announced earlier, the repentance tawbah. beautiful story, an amazing story. Um, it's, it's subhanAllah, it's a story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran, right? 
and it's been mentioned in more detail in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wasallam. The story of the repentance of Ka'ab ibn Malik and his two companions, it revolves around the mercy of Allah, his forgiveness, right? That's what it kind of revolves around, right? The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his forgiveness and his repentance. Uh, before getting into the story, I do want to mention that in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are many, many, many stories. A lot, right? Many stories. And all these revealed stories, there's a reason why Allah has revealed them. In fact, some of the people of knowledge they mentioned, perhaps a third of the Quran is stories. Stories of the Prophet. Story of the Prophet and stories of other nations. So, and there's more stories in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in our deen, there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories. I, I bring this up because you might get some people saying, stories are not really beneficial in the deen. That's not true. The manhaj of the Quran states otherwise, right? And the purpose behind these revealed stories, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Himself explained why these stories are there for us. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ Can anybody finish it? Anyone? لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ Where are the Hufad? Shaykh Ahmed, I hear a lot of, there's a lot of Hufad in Khalid ibn Walid. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةٌ Right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Regarding these stories, the story of Adam and his, uh, alayhi salam and his two sons, Ib Ibrahim and his father, story of Musa, story of uh, Daud, Ayyub, Shu'aib, Zakariya, all the stories of the prophets, and all the other stories, non-prophet stories, all of them, the reason behind their mention, the reason why they are mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah is for Ibrah. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Ibrah meaning a lesson. And a benefit. So the purpose behind these stories is not to really waste your time. The purpose behind these stories is for us as Muslims to read them, learn them, right? And extract benefits from these stories. And then after that, what? Ma'asalama? And then what's after that? What's that word? Apply. Jazakallah khairan. We learn them extract the benefits, and then we apply these stories within our lives. That's the whole purpose. So this story, Kabdul Malik and his uh, two companions, uh, again, it's a beautiful story. It's a story that um, uh, Imam Ahmed, the scholar of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? Imam Ahmed, every time he read this story, he would cry. That's what his son said, Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmed, who was a scholar in his own right. He said, ما رأيت أبي باكيا إلا عند قراءة توبة الله على كعب بن مالك. Right? So, the, so uh, Imam Ahmed, every time he used to come across the story, he used to cry. طيب, getting to the story, as we all know, um, after the Fath of Mecca, the conquest of Mecca, as we all know, it was a very huge, huge moment for the Muslims. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Huge moment. And after this incident of Fath Makkah, what happened was, it got some of the enemies of Islam worried. They're worried. Why are they worried? They're worried because the Muslims, according to them, the Muslims are now spreading in the lands. The Muslims are returning back home in Mecca. The Muslims are going to take over the Arabian Peninsula. The Muslims... Muhammad وسلم, and the Muslims are going to take over the whole region. So it was, they were worried. So the ruler of Byzantine, he said, let's stop the Muslims where they're at right now. If we don't do anything right now, the Muslims, it's going to get to a point where we cannot do anything about the Muslims. They're going to take over everywhere. So let's stop them right now. So, and, so what he did was he gathered some of his uh, allies, within the region, and this is what led to the battle of Tabuk. The Prophet 
uh, he announced to the Muslims this battle, the Battle of Tabuk, and he told the Muslims, prepare for the battle. This battle, the Battle of Tabuk, it's going to be a very long battle. It's going to be very hot. It's in the desert. It's far away. We are vastly outnumbered. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling the Muslims, prepare for this battle. Prepare for this battle. And it was made obligatory, an obligation upon the Muslims to come and support the Prophet ﷺ and go out to the Battle of Tabuk. Now, two, two groups of people were excluded or did not come to this battle. Obviously, number one, the people who had a valid reason, they were sick. Maybe they were, you know, maybe they were very elderly, right? These groups of people, a group of uh, people who had an, uh, even a worldly obligation that they cannot leave. So there's a certain group of people that were excused from coming. And then you had another group of people who were not coming, who were the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. They weren't coming. They weren't coming because of their nifaq, their hypocrisy. And then you have a third group of people who were not, who did not have any valid excuse and were not from the hypocrites. This third group is Ka'b ibn Malik and his two companions, Hilal ibn Umayyah and Murar ibn Rabi'ah. These three noble companions, they weren't from the first group, they didn't have a valid excuse, and also they obviously were not from the hypocrites because they were noble companions of the Prophet Now, Ka'b ibn Malik, when he got older, he uh, he's narrating the story when he, as he got older and he mentioned when the Prophet ﷺ announced this expedition I was actually strong I was strong you know right I had you know and I, on top of that I was wealthy meaning I was able to go it was possible I could have went however the only problem was the only problem was I kept on delaying my preparation when the Muslims were getting ready I kept on delaying it. Tomorrow I will prepare. Captain Malik told himself. Tomorrow came. The next day I will prepare. The next day came. The day after I'll prepare. The day after came. And so on and so forth. So that was the problem with Captain Malik. And um, so that's, he kept on telling himself until it got to the day of departure. The Muslims were leaving. They were leaving Makkah. They're finally ready. They're prepared. The Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims, the companions, now they're going. And even on that day, even on that day, Ka'ib ibn Malik tells himself, Insha'Allah, yes, they are leaving. They are leaving. However, I could still catch up to them. There's still time to prepare. I could still catch up to them. Right? It's, it's not a big deal. It's uh, an armor, right? A shield. It's okay. You know, inshallah, the Prophet won't notice. So one person, I could, inshallah, make it up and ca uh, catch up to them. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, now they leave Medina. On their way to Tabuk. They reach Tabuk. And subhanallah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he notices Ka'b ibn Malik is not present. He's not there. Out of all the people, out of all the people, he notices Ka'b ibn Malik. He's not here. Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? Where is Ka'b ibn Malik? And there's a, there's a side of benefit here as Muslims. Uh, and subhanAllah, this is from the, the trait of the Prophet Wasallam in how he was towards his Muslim brothers. The Prophet, he was very caring, right? If he did not see his Muslim brother for a certain amount of days in the masjid or elsewhere, he'll say, where is so-and-so? Where is he? The Prophet had that care and that love for his companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, so the Prophet asked the people, where is Ka'b? A man from Bani Salima, he stood up and he said, oh messenger of Allah, Ka'b ibn Malik, he's rich now. He's rich. He's wealthy. Kind of insinuating that he did not come because of his wealth. He's too busy with his flus, huh? He's very busy with his money. Very busy. And, some, and you know, that's how sometimes people are. Some people are like that. Some people always, the first chance they can get, 
they will throw their Muslim brother under the bus, right? So, as he said that, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, another noble companion, he stood up and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, what he said, it's evil, it's not true. Ka'b ibn Malik is a very good Muslim, right? Ka'b ibn Malik is a very good Muslim. We've known him for a long time. We, O oh Messenger of Allah, we know nothing, nothing but good from Ka'b ibn Malik. Nothing but good. So the Prophet wasallam, upon hearing this, he remained silent. Some time goes by, um, and the battle takes place. The battle of Tabuk takes place. And, uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we won't get into the details of the battle of uh, Tabuk, but inshallah ta'ala for your own readings, read up the story of what happened exactly in that battle. But for the purpose of this muhadara, we'll stick with the story of Ka'b ibn Malik and his two companions. So, um, battle takes place, and then the battle is done, and the Muslims are now coming back. They're coming back to Medina. And Ka'b ibn Malik, he's panicking now. He's panicking. Why is he panicking? The Prophet and his Muslims are coming back. He's regretting the fact that he did not participate in this battle. The other battles he participated in them. He's really regretting it now. And there's panic. And the only thing that's in Ka'b ibn Malik's mind, the only thing that's in his mind is, what can I possibly say to the Prophet ﷺ when he comes? What can I say? What can I say? Right? And uh, we all have been, we all probably been in these situations where you, you probably have an, you have an exam coming up. Um, you have two weeks to study for that exam. And the first week, maybe you're busy with work, you're busy with Netflix, you're busy with certain stuff. Then, and then the second week, you're busy with something else as well. All of a sudden you realize it's the night before the exam. So you're panicking. You're panicking because the exam, you need to do well. And you're also regretting the last two weeks. You wasted a lot of time. So this is what happened to Ka'b ibn Malik. Um, so now the Muslims they come, and the Prophet وسلم, they come back. They come back. And the Prophet, every the Prophet وسلم, every time he came back from a trip, he would stop by the masjid and pray two rak'ah. Right? That was from his sunnah, right? So anytime we're coming back to the city, us right here, you're at Pearson Airport, Swing by Khalid ibn Walid, right? Swing by Khalid, pray two rak'ah, and then go home. And then go home. So the Muslims and the Prophet, they come back. The Prophet comes, up, comes to his masjid, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He prays two rak'ah. And then after he's finished, there's a lineup of people. There's a lineup of people. Ka'b ibn Malik said, there were about 80 of them. There were 80 people lined up to speak to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And give their excuse why they did not attend the battle of Tabuk. The first person will come and say, O oh, Messenger of Allah, the dog was sick, right? <laughs> o oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, elderly family was sick, I was sick. O oh, Messenger of Allah, the, uh, the, the garden was on fire, right? So people were coming with different excuses to the Messenger of Allah. And each and every single person, he would hear them out, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hear them out, and then after that say, may Allah forgive you. The next person, with their excuse, may Allah forgive you. The next person, the excuse, the Prophet will hear them out, may Allah forgive you. And so on and so forth. Until it got to Ka'ab ibn Malik at the end. Ka'ab ibn Malik, he comes to the Prophet and he says, Assalamu alaikum ya Rasulullah. The Prophet says, alaikum assalam. And the Prophet had a smile that had some anger to it. You know how when you're trying to be nice and you're trying to smile, but there's something bother you, bothering you, you're a bit upset, you're a bit angry at something. Can somebody do that face, that smile? A smile that has a little bit of an anger to it. Just put up your hand, someone. You smile that has some anger. Jazakal khaira, like that right there, right? Jazakal khaira. So, so the Prophet is looking at Ka'b ibn Malik and he has that smile with some anger to it. And Ka'b ibn Malik comes closer and the Prophet starts off by giving him excuses. Were you unable to come? Did you not have any means to come? And so on and so forth. Ka'b ibn Malik, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah. Wallahi, honestly, I, I have no excuse. No excuse. I am very eloquent. I am able to give you an excuse that could convince you 
I can make something up, right? But I, I really have no excuse, right? I really have no excuse. Um, and he also told the Prophet Sallallahu if I were to give you something right now as an excuse, right? And make something up, yes, right now, this moment, you, you, might be able, you might be happy with me and you might accept what I have to say. However, I fear that in the future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would expose me and cause you to hate me. So there's, there's no benefit in making up an excuse and like, honestly, I wasn't able to come. I don't have an excuse. So the Prophet sallallahu he turns to his companions and he says, this man right here, Ka'ab ibn Balik, he has spoken the truth. He has spoken the truth. And then he tells Ka'ab ibn Balik, wait until Allah decides regarding your affair. Wait till Allah regarding your affair. Now, some of the people and, uh, and every group of, every community, there's, these group of there's, there's a group of people in every community that are always troublemakers, right? So a group of people, they come to uh, Ka'ab ibn Malik, they're like, Ka'ab, why don't you, you should have done what the other people did. You should have made something up. You should have said, just said anything. You saw what the Prophet how he dealt with the others. You saw that. The Prophet accepted their excuse. And on top of that, made dua for them. May Allah forgive you. He could have done the same thing, Ka'ab. Why didn't you do that? Right? There's always people like that. Even though you're making the right decision in your life, there's always people that always try to make you feel bad. So now he, Ka'ab Malik, he feels very bad. He feels very bad about the whole situation. Time goes by. Um, and that same night, the Prophet Sallallahu sends a, a messenger uh, to tell Ka'ab and the Muslims, everyone, do not speak to Ka'ab ibn Malik. O Muslims, do not speak to Ka'ab ibn Malik. Now, as soon as this information, and uh, Ka'ab ibn Malik hears this information, he starts, to, he starts to like wonder, is there anybody else in the city who's in this same situation as me? Is there anyone else, right? Because a lot of times, psychologically, if, um, if you're going through a problem, a challenge, something, and you know that there's other people also experiencing this as well, it makes you feel better, right? So Kabin Malik is asking, um, he's trying to find out, is there anybody else in this situation as me? And he's told yes. Hilal ibn Umayyah and Murara ibn Rabi'ah. Once he hears these two names, Ka'ab ibn Malik knows them. He knows them to be righteous companions. So he feels a bit better now. He feels a bit better. Now, these are the three people. Hilal, right? Anybody know the other name? Anybody? Can anybody say the three names? Ka'ab ibn Malik and the, his two companions, their names? Huh? Hilal? Murara. Jazakal khair. So now, th these three people, people are dealing with them like they don't even exist now. Boycotting in a way, right? People are not speaking to them. People are not speaking to them. Kabir Malik, he was a bit younger. So he, he used to go within the community. He used to go to the marketplace. He used to go to the masjid to talk to the people. Although nobody's talking to him. He goes to the marketplace. Nobody's buying or selling to him. He goes to the masjid. He, yes, he could pray. But nobody's saying salam alaikum to him. Nobody's responding back to him with alaikum salam, right? And he even mentioned Ka'ab ibn Malik. At one point, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he noticed the Prophet looking at him. As soon as he looked at the Prophet, the Prophet turned away, right? So this is what their situation. As for his two companions, they mainly remained at home, right? Ka'ab ibn Malik said they remained at home. They were devastated. They were devastated and they were crying, right? Um... After about 40 days, and subhanAllah, it's as if things cannot get any worse, right? So after about 40 days, the Prophet sends a messenger telling Ka'ab ibn Malik and his companions, separate from your wives. Separate from your wives, right? Ka'ab ibn Malik says, should I divorce them? And the messenger says, no, right? But just separate from them. So Ka'ab ibn Malik tells his wife to go to your parents' house. Same thing with his two companions. The only exception was Hilal. 
Hilal's wife was given permission because she had to take care of him. There's some need that he had that she had to take care of him. So she was given a special um, uh, exemption, right? Permission to stay with her husband. Again, the problem makers in the community came again and they said, Captain Malik, why don't you also try to get, speak to the Prophet, get permission for your wife to stay with you, just like Hilal. Just like Hilal, right? So after some time goes by, he doesn't listen to them, some time goes by, um, Kabir Malik now, he's getting depressed. No one's talking to him at all, right? His wife is no longer with him. He's getting depressed. And he, he's looking for love, somebody to just kind of support him. He visits Abu Qatada. Abu Qatada, a relative of his, a companion, a noble companion as well. They grew up with each other. They go way back. They used to study Islam with each other. They know each other very well. To Kabir Malik, Abu Qatada is very dear. So Kabir Malik, he goes to Abu Qatada. He says, Abu Qatada, do you bear witness that I love Allah and his messenger? Abu Qatada, his close friend and cousin, Right? A person who's known him for a long time remains silent. Ka'ab ibn Malik asks again, Abu Qatada, Abu Qatada, do you bear witness that I love Allah and His Messenger? For the second time, he remains silent. Abu Qatada, do you bear witness that I love Allah and His Messenger? The third time, Abu Qatada said, Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and His Messenger know best. And Kabir uh, Maliki said, when as soon as Abu Qatada said that, Wallahi, I broke down into tears. I broke down into tears. But Alhamdulillah, inna ma'al usri yusra, right? After every difficulty, there is some ease. About a few days later, or on the 50th day, of this whole story. Ka'ab bin Malik, he doesn't go to the masjid, he prays Fajr uh, on the rooftop of his house, and then he hears a man on a mountain calling out, O oh, Ka'ab ibn Malik, O oh, Ka'ab ibn Malik, Abshir, receive glad tidings. Receive glad tidings. Ka'ab ibn Malik said, I don't know exactly what happened, but I knew that something good has happened. Right? So he fell down into sujood al-shukr, the prostration of thankfulness. This man comes with his horse. So this horseman now tells Ka'ab ibn Malik, Allah has forgiven you, O Ka'ab. Allah has forgiven you. Ka'ab was so happy to hear that. Right? He said, I wanted to give him a gift. Just by hearing that, I wanted to give him a gift. But I had nothing on me. So I took off my shirt and I gave it to him as a gift. That's how happy he was. And this horseman, as a, the messenger, he told Ka'ab bin Malik, the Prophet Sassim also wants to see you. Go to the Prophet Sassim, he wants to see you. Ka'ab Malik, he said, Wallahi, I had no shirt. I had to borrow a shirt, put it on, to go visit the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's when, the, once Ka'ab bin Malik, he comes to the masjid, he sees the Prophet, and he says, his, the Prophet Sassim, his face, it's as if it was shining like the moon. A beautiful look to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's when the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told Ka'ab ibn Malik, O Ka'ab, Allah has forgiven you. And Allah has revealed verses regarding the situation. وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِبَا رَحُبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَلَّا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَكُونُوا مَعَ الصَّادِقِينَ right. These verses have been real, revealed regarding Ka'ab ibn Malik. Ka'ab now, he, he's amazed. He's amazed at the situation. It's as if he couldn't believe it. He asked the Messenger, he asked the messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah revealed messages, uh, verses regarding me, right? Big news. How often does somebody, while they're on earth, how often do people who live on earth find out that Allah has forgiven them? 
before the Akhirah. Right? So he's very excited. So he says, O Messenger of Allah, everything I have, I'm going to give it in charity, Sadaqah. Everything. My businesses, my house, everything. The Prophet said, calm down, relax, relax. You know, not everything. So maybe some, but keep some, keep some for your family and your, you know, yourself as well. Right? Not everything. Uh, Ka'ab Malik, he tells the Prophet, I said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, bear witness. And the Muslims, bear witness that from this day forward, I'm never ever going to lie. He himself learned from this whole situation, this story that happened to him. I will never ever lie. And when he got older and he's narrating this hadith, he mentioned, I never had the desire to ever lie again. Never. There was times where in my life I was tempted to lie, but because of the situation, I did not do it. I did not do it. Right? I want to share, uh, I want to share, inshallah ta'ala, um, a few benefits from this story, inshallah. Number one, uh, wealth, wealth can be a distraction, right? If wealth is money is not always bad, not always. Sometimes it's a blessing. What's important for a Muslim is to make sure you are in control of your wealth. That's what it comes down to. The moment you start choosing your wealth over your deen, that's when the wealth is a fitna. That's the first point. The second point is, we learn from this story, the evilness of procrastinating, right? I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. A lot of times, this mentality, it's not very harmful. But it can be disastrous when it comes to your deen. If you're procrastinating with regards to your tawbah, your repentance, you're asking Allah to forgive you. If you are procrastinating regarding that, there, there's a possibility where tomorrow might not come. And that happens a lot. Tomorrow might not come. A young brother, actually, subhanAllah, a few days ago, 15 years old, he said, Brother Shaib, I, I love music. I love music. And, and I'm also talented. Right? I'm talented. Um, but, and I know it's bad, it's haram, it's not a good thing. I know that. Uh, but is it, like, what, what do you think if I just continue till I'm 18? He's 15 years old. If I just continue till I'm 18, and then once I'm 18, I become a better Muslim, right? I become a better Muslim, and I ask Allah to forgive me. What about that? Right? So I, I said, Akhi al Karim, two problems here, two main problems. Number one, you cannot guarantee yourself that you live till 18. In fact, you can't even guarantee yourself that you live till tomorrow, till the next hour. That's not a guarantee. That's number one. That's number one, right? And if you happen to die when you're 16 or 17, then you're held accountable for your sins. Tomorrow did not come. That's number one, right? That's number one. The second problem is also how, let's say you do get to 18, for example, you do reach 18. How do you know if you're going to ask Allah to forgive you, how do you know if you're going to repent? Because the way how sins work, the more a person is involved in sins and disobeying Allah, right? The harder it can get to even make tawbah. Your heart might become sealed because of your sins. Allah might not give you tawfiq when you're 18 to make repentance. Right? So the point here is, don't be a person who procrastinates with regards to your deen. Um, regarding toba as well, there's other benefits we can learn from this story, by the way. Sujood as shukur, right? When something good happens to you, and uh, a sister that you're trying to marry finally said yes, right? Sujood as shukur. The coming back, right, from a trip to Raka'ah, the masjid. There's many things we can learn, but I want to stick to the points on, you know, repentance and toba, the theme of this conference. Um, one benefit that we learn from this story is it's important to regret if you made a sin. If you did something haram, you disobeyed Allah, that regret is important. It's kind of like the door to repentance. It's the first thing you do. Because it doesn't make sense. If a person is not regretting their sin, how can you make tawbah, right? So it's important to, as soon as something bad happens, you're trying to repent. The first thing, you are regretting that sin, right? And lastly, with regards to repentance, one lesson. Yes, abshir, abshir, abshir. 30 seconds, okay? 30 seconds? I'll be done. Khalas, Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. 
The other thing is, even though you repent to Allah, this is the last benefit, inshallah, even though you repent to Allah, know that you can still be tried. You can still be tried with that same sin. If a person is having a struggle with some type of sin, and then they end up making tawbah, alhamdulillah, that's a good thing. Know that it is possible you can still be tried with that same sin after your tawbah, right? So it's important that we are strong and you know, we are patient with regards to that. I had, I had a few more things to say, but inshallah time ran out. Salah is, most, is more important than the muhadara. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all. I ask Allah to bless all of us and to grant us tawbah to nasuha, right? A sincere repentance. Subhanakallahum bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Barakallahu fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Inshallah, just want to let everybody know that we're going to be starting, inshallah, in about a minute or so. So, um, whoever, inshallah, is going to be joining us for the uh, lecture, inshallah, make your way into the prayer hall. Barakallahu feekum. Or if not, inshallah, start winding down and move, inshallah, closer to the exits. Barakallahu feekum. I'm just going to give it a minute, inshallah, till it kind of quiets down, inshallah. No, he's, he's, yeah, he's just finishing his salah, so I'm just waiting for that and for the whole ritual. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Amma Bad, the title of the lecture, inshallah, tonight is Do Not Despair of Allah's Mercy, which is a translation of what Allah Azza wa Jal commands us in the Quran. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair of Allah's mercy. Do not give up on the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful. So this is a command for us to properly understand the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how vast and big it is. Because when you understand this, it will prompt you to act in a different way, to live differently. Because it's really based on your connection and understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you do act and that you change your behavior. So, when you want to know who Allah Azza wa Jal is, there is a theoretical side and there is a practical side to it, right? If Allah Azza wa Jal is the All Merciful, then what do you expect from Him? Mercy. If Allah Azza wa Jal is the All Vengeful, what do you expect from Him? Vengeance and punishment. And that really reflects on how you live and how you react to Him and the possibility of repentance. And the efficacy of repentance. Like, do I repent? Because if I repent and Allah Azza wa Jal is little forgiving, then there's little chance that my repentance will be accepted. But if Allah is the all merciful, then there's always a chance that Allah Azza wa Jal will accept my repentance. Then that invitation is being extended to you and I as long as we're alive, as long as we are breathing. So the Prophet والسلام, said, In Allah yaqbalu tawbat al abdi ma lam yugargir. Allah accepts the repentance of a person as long as his soul did not depart his body. The gargara is when it passes through the throat, meaning that's the final stage of it. So Allah accepts his repentance as long as he's alive. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said about Allah Azza wa Jalla, "Inna Allah yabsutu yadahu bin nahari." لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ اللَّيْلِ وَيَبْسُطُ يَدَهُ بِاللَّيْلِ لِيَتُوبَ مُسِيءُ النَّهَارِ Allah extends His hand at night so that the sinner of night, the night sinner, would repent in the morning. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, the, not, the day sinner would repent at night. He would extend His hand at night so that the day sinner would repent at night and would extend His hand 
in the morning or during the day so that the night sinner would repent. Meaning constantly the door of repentance is open to everyone. Which tells you that Allah Azza wa Jal invites all of us to repent and loves that from us and wants it to happen every single night and every single day and as long as you're alive. So I'm saying that there is a theoretical side and a practical side. The theoretical side is what kind of God am I worshipping? And what type of relationship will I have with him? Now I'm not going to stress that as much, but I really want to stress the practical side. That is, if I am a person who have done a lot of bad things and almost have given up on myself, or had come to believe that there is no possible way for me to change, or no possible for me for me, possible way for me to gain Allah's repentance or gain Allah's favor, be able to repent. Right? That is these two things. Either that I've given up on myself, that I cannot, or that Allah will not. And to both of these things we want to say you are wrong. No matter what you have done and how awful it is, as long as you are willing to come back to Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah is willing to receive you. And Allah is willing to forgive it. And Allah is willing to change you. So once a man comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, and they said that he was an, such an old man that his... Um, he has, he's using a cane to walk and his face right, is so wrinkled, right? It was dropping, you know, his eyes were almost covered with his skin. So he was coming to the Prophet والسلام, and he asked him, he said, see if a man had con committed everything, everything on the face of this earth, didn't leave a sin, to the extent that if these sins were to be distributed on all people of earth, it would be enough for them to be sinful. Right? So he's talking about himself and his past. And then he said, will Allah forgive him? If I'm such a person, I'd lived for such a long time and committed all these awful things in his mind, all the people of earth, if they would care to carry this, all of them would be sinful, deserving of Allah's punishment. Can he be forgiven? So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, did you accept Islam? And he said, yes. Then he said, ﷺ, if you accept Islam and you do good and you leave the bad that you have done, Allah will change all the bad that you did into good. So he said, وغدرات وفجرات. He says, all my betrayals and all my major big sins, he says, وَغَدَرَاتُكَ وَفَجَرَاتُكَ All your betrayals and all your big sins, all that will be changed into good deeds. So the, that man went back and he is repeating the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, وَغَدَرَاتِ وَفَجَرَاتِ Even my betrayals and even my major sins, all of that will be forgiven and not only be forgiven, but changed into what? Something good. So imagine such a person who had lived such a checkered past of this and that terrible acts. And that person may think to themselves that there is no hope for me anymore. How could there be any hope? And that is an assessment that we can have of ourselves. I am that terrible person. Right? You know how you meet someone and they've decided to give up on themselves? Right? I'm just no good. They do that in the dunya. I'm not smart. Right? I'm not smart. I'm not good at this and that. I can't hold a job. I can't get married. I'm not good with this. So they've given up on themselves when it comes to the dunya. Either because of bad experiences or somebody told them that about themselves or they've decided that that's who they are and were and will always be. But there are also people who have given them themselves in the deen as well, in religion as well. That's not for me. I could never be able to do this. I would love to, 
I know it's beautiful, but I am that type of person. I am a bad person. I will always deal. I will always drink. I'll always gamble. I'll always fornicate. This is me. So you've downgraded yourself, and because you downgrade yourself, you've given up on two things, on yourself and the possibility of repentance, and on Allah Azza wa Jal rescuing you and accepting you back. You don't think that that's possible. That's for everybody else. And there's always the whispers of the shaitan in it to tell you not to try and to tell you that you're beyond repair. So that person, when he comes and he asks the Prophet ﷺ, he wants to know that, is there still hope for me? And the Prophet ﷺ said what? Yes, but there's a condition. What is that condition? You accepted Islam? Yes. Now, Ahsanta wa tarakta sayyat. If you do good and you stop the bad that you've done, then yes. Allah will forgive all of it. And also, in addition to it, switch the bad that you did into a good deed. So just imagine that invitation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something similar Amr ibn al-As radiyallahu anhu did when he came and to give the bay'ah to the Prophet والسلام, and accept Islam, but he held his hand back and he said, and I did this and that in the jahiliyyah. What about all of this? And the Prophet وسلم, he told him that Islam cancels what had come before it. And Hajj cancels what comes before it. And Tawbah cancels what comes before it. So Allah Azza wa Jal had put humanity on earth not to condemn them, not to punish them, not to doom them, but to extract them with mercy to Jannah. That's the purpose of it. So Adam alayhi salam, for you to understand the destiny of humanity and where humanity is destined to be, Adam alayhi salam, when he was created, where did Allah put him? In Jannah. Why did Allah put him in Jannah? What did he do to deserve any of that? Did he do anything? Nothing, right? So what got him out of Jannah? Disobedience. Otherwise, his home is where? It's Jannah. Now, when he disobeyed Allah Azza wa Jal, did Allah forgive him? Absolutely. And Allah Azza wa Jal revealed to Adam alayhi salam what to say. قَالَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ They say, Ya Allah, we have wronged ourselves. And if you do not forgive us and be merciful with us, we'll be among the transgressors, the losers. Because Allah says, فَتَلَقَّ آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتِ Adam received these sentences from Allah Azza wa Jal who taught him how to repent and Allah Azza wa Jal accepted his repentance. And Adam alayhi salam, was he better or worse after his repentance? Better. Do you understand? That Adam alayhi salam, because he had learned the lesson from it. That's why you may ask yourself, why is it no matter how good we are, we are destined to sin? Who among us is sinless? Who among us, who among us does not commit an act that, by which he disobeys Allah Azza wa Who among us does not read, need repentance and mercy every single day? So if you were to ask yourself, why is it that we are destined to sin? Because through that sin, you discover Allah's forgiveness and Allah's repentance and you go back to him subhanahu wa ta'ala and by that you become a better person. Right? Through it, Allah equips you to understand your own frailty and weakness. Because if, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ لَوْ لَمْ تُذْنِبُوا He says, if you were not to commit sins, I would fear for you what is greater than that, self-admiration, al-ujb. You understand? Which is more disastrous. Because when you sin, sometimes you understand your limitations. You understand your need for Allah Azza wa Jal. It breaks you. And that, a breaking of the ego, is what brings you closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Versus somebody 
who's always praying and fasting and reading the Quran, but he thinks that this is all happening because of him, not Allah. So that repentance that Allah Azza wa Jal loves so much is there because of his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah Azza wa Jal, one of the greatest and most consistent of his qualities is rahma, mercy. Right? Not punishment and not anger. And there are many a hadith and ayat to affirm this so that you understand who is Allah Azza wa Jal that you are worshipping. So if I ask you, is Allah Azza wa Jal a vengeful God, right? Or a merciful God, what would you say? A merciful. Though Allah Azza wa Jal can act in vengeance at times, يعني ينتقم من أعدائه. He could avenge. But that is an act. But that is not a name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because a name of Allah Azza wa Jal refers to a constant quality of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the constant quality is that of rahmah, of mercy. Because He is always merciful. Right? So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, In Allah kataba kitaban indahu qabla an yakhliq al khalq, in rahmati sabakat ghadabi. He said, alayhi salatu wa sallam, that Allah had written in a record that is with Him underneath His throne or next to the throne that my mercy supersedes my anger. And that is before this creation. Before the creation of anything in this universe, Allah wrote this. And that statement that is written down is a declaration. Right? Because it's connected to creation. It's a declaration about this creation. What is it? What is the intention of that creation? Why did Allah create it? Is it for mercy or punishment and vengeance? It's for mercy. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal opens the door of mercy quite open and calls people to it and warns people consistently against violating his commands because Allah Azza wa wants to save. So the first hadith we said that Allah Azza wa wrote that my mercy supersedes my anger, overwhelms my anger. So you expect Allah Azza wa Jal to be more merciful than angry and more forgiving than vengeful. In a, in a ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ My mercy encompasses everything. Everything. Right? And رَبَّنَا وَسِعْتَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ رَحْمَةً وَعِلْمًا He says, Ya Allah, you've encompassed everything in knowledge and in mercy. So do we understand what it means when Allah Azza wa says that his rahmah encompasses everything and that his knowledge and rahmah encompass everything? So let's ask the question, does Allah know everything about everything? So every small thing that you have, every speck, no matter how small and everything, no matter how big, Allah knows about it because it is a shape, a thing. So similarly, Allah's rahmah covers all of that. From the smallest to the biggest, just like his ilm, his knowledge covers everything. Isn't that what the ayah is saying? As Allah's knowledge covers entirety of existence that he created, from the smallest to the biggest, so is his mercy. So everything that Allah created enjoys Allah's mercy, even the disbelievers. Do the disbelievers enjoy Allah's mercy or not? How? Give me an example. Yeah. Isn't it that Allah Azza is feeding them and clothing them and giving them shelter and wealth and health and protects them from illness, right? And He gives them children and spouses and love 
and they find success in this life and they find joy in this life is in that mercy and that they at times when they ask Allah Azza wa Jal and they pray Allah answers their dua right and is in that mercy so every being every animal Allah Azza wa Jal had endowed had given his mercy to and they are roughly they are swimming in Allah's mercy swimming in Allah's rahmah and there's a very beautiful hadith from the Prophet والسلام, that gives people a lot of hope. He said والسلام, that Allah Azza wa Jal, when He created this creation, He created Rahmah and He divided it into a hundred portions. He kept 99 with Him and He sent one of the 100 to this earth and it is through this mercy that people are merciful with each other and it is through this mercy that animals are merciful with each other all of them even when the horse right takes care not to overstep and trample its children even when a mother is merciful with its child he says all of creation is merciful because of that one single mercy that Allah sent to this earth. And on the day of judgment, Allah will take this mercy back, join it with the other 99 to complete a hundred again. And that is the mercy that people will find on the day of judgment. So you think you are merciful, right? Right? Everybody, every human being, I think, believes to one extent or another that they are merciful. And they would contradict and object to Allah's decisions on the basis that I'm more merciful than this. How is it that there is an earthquake where a lot of people died? I would be more merciful than that, right? Right? How is it that people die because of an illness? I would be more merciful than this. How is it that a mother has just lost her child and she's, you know, heartbroken? I would be merciful than, more merciful than this and I would not do this. Not understanding that the mercy that you are expressing is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the mercy that exists on this earth, part of a fraction that the mercy that Allah created, that is nothing compared to the Allah's infinite mercy that is His attribute. Nothing. Would be like somebody who is forcing his child to go to school and you look at that and you say, how merciless you are waking this child at such an early time just to force him to go to school where is the love that you have for your child so you look at it, the very restricted image of a picture and by it you want to judge right the action of a parent and the parent would tell you well I'm forcing them to go to school because why it benefits them even if they Dislike it. Even if they cry having to go to school, I know that they have to do it, so I have to force them to do it. So a parent will tell you, if you cannot see it, if you can't see the whole picture, it has to happen. Huh? Later. It has to happen this way for their own benefit. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, right, sees the entire picture. And you only see what? A snapshot, snapshot of it. Just a small portion of it. And you want to challenge Allah's mercy. I would do things differently. No, Allah's mercy is so vast that a person has to submit to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they don't understand it, like they submit to Him in things and other things that they don't understand. Like they submit to Him in things that overwhelm them and they find that they have to go along with it because there is have no other choice except to submit to the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. Can you challenge the power of Allah? Allah Azza wa Jal will subdue you, right? If you challenge Him. You'll see this in your life. If you want to try, I will, I'm going to challenge the power of Allah Azza wa Jal, then don't age. What do you think? Don't age. Or say, I'm not going to get sick. Try it. Then Allah Azza wa will subdue you and make you sick. Just to understand your limit. 
Right? I will not fail in anything that I will do. Try it. Then you'll fail. You understand your limitation. Okay, I can't do everything that I've set my mind to. I can't do anything physically that I want to do. I don't understand everything because so many things escape my knowledge, right? That's why you fail. You don't understand reality. You don't understand your own limits and potential. So you fail. So Allah wants to show you that. You think you understand the universe around you. Again, even manage your own life at times. So when you understand the limits that Allah Azza wa Jal had imposed on us, natural limits, they'll understand then that we cannot fully comprehend Allah's mercy. And it's actually a great thing because the vastness of that mercy is the thing that allows us to enter Jannah. Right? It's the thing that allows us to repent all the time, no matter what we have done, as long as we want to. So our past doesn't define us. The bad that we have done doesn't define us, as long as you want to change. So the famous story of this man who killed 99, and he wanted to repent. And he went and asked, can I repent? And this first person told him, no. Repentance is not possible for you because you killed 99. Right? So he killed him. He went to ask another person. And he said, of course Allah's repentance is available to everybody as long as they want to repent. But the place where you live, where you stay, that city is a bad place for you. You can't repent if you stay there. You have to move. So he wanted to move and he started to move and on his way, Allah took his soul. So Allah Azza wa then sends both angels or both types of angels. The angels of mercy and the angels of punishment. And when they descend, they argue. The angels of mercy said, he had come repenting to Allah Azza wa we should take him. And the angels of punishment, they said, he did this and that, we should take him. So Allah Azza wa revealed to them, to do what? Measure the distance between the two cities to see to which is he closer. And then Allah Azza wa made the distance between where his death, the spot of his death, and that new city, shorter. So that he would go where? he would go to Jannah right? now we understand what the benefit of this story because we want, when, you want, when we want to understand Allah's mercy we want to understand it right when we say it's available available to whom so this person his past was terrible 99 100 people how could you come out of that so maybe there was something in him something that he was doing right, that could have helped him. Like a person in a story it is said, so-and-so was a sinful person. And he had a friend and he was giving him da'wah and reminding him and this and that. And that person always, you know, apologizes, you know, pushes back by saying, I'm trying and this and that. Leave me to Allah, Azza wa Allah may guide me. Leave me to Allah, Allah may guide me. So that person almost gave up on him. He died, that sinful person. He died. And after his death, he had a dream about him. This friend, he had a dream about him. And in that dream, he dreamt that he was in heaven. He was in heaven. He was surprised. How could he be in such a place? Of all the things I know about him. So he went and he asked his family. He said, what did he do to deserve that, if my dream is true? They said, yes, we know all the bad things that he used to do. But also one thing that he used to do that he wouldn't tell people about is that every single week he would take money for in sadaqah and he would go and he would give it and give it to the poor. And he would say, make dua for me that Allah would you know, lead me to repentance and accept repentance for me. And that was his habit. So we think that if Allah Azza wa Jal accepted him, it, he accepted him because of that. Now, what that tells you is what? 
You could be a terrible person, but even if you are a terrible person, there's always a glimmer of hope if you're do, still doing something good. With all the bad that is happening, you're still doing something good because that good thing may come and save you. I'm going to give sadaqah. I know all the bad things I'm doing. And I'm not happy with myself. And I want to change. And I will never normalize nor justify the bad things that I'm doing. And I will never say that they are okay. Or that my lifestyle is okay. These are conditions. Because once you start saying this haram is halal, you're in deep trouble. How would you change them? Right? Because the man who killed 99, did he accept that their death was okay? That these killings were okay? He always knew that what he was doing was wrong. And he always knew that he wanted to be better and change. So in you, if you normalize misbehavior and sin, you're in deep trouble. Because you cannot repent. You cannot change. And that in effect becomes a bigger sin than the sin itself. When you start saying that, dealing drugs or taking drugs is okay, that's worse than selling them. Do you believe that? Even if you haven't sold an ounce, you don't understand the difference? Even if you didn't drink a sip of wine or beer, but you say it's halal, that's worse. Because drinking it or selling it or buying it is a major sin. Saying it's halal is what? Disbelief. Because you're rebelling against the word of Allah Azza wa You're challenging Allah. So if you normalize, if you accept, that's the issue. But if you're doing something and you know it's wrong, but at the same time, you're doing as much good as you can, like that man, and you know that you want to change, there's always hope. And that's what you want to do. If you do something bad, and let that be a habit. If you do something bad, follow that with a good thing to erase it. What can you do to erase a bad thing that you can do that you have done? Hmm? Do a good thing. Give me an example of good things that are easy, quick, can be done. Sadaqah. So you give sadaqah, yeah. Giving food to the poor. Beautiful, yeah. Visiting people who are sick. But I'm looking for easy things, right? You're going to still find a sick person and you still have to find them. Dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything. Huh? Quran. And two ayah. Pray salah. Perfect. Wonderful. Pray salah, right? So there is salah to tawbah, right? A tawbah, which is that you want to repent, so you pray two rak'az immediately, if whatever you've done, right? With the intention that I don't want to go back to this thing. I want Allah Azza wa to help me overcome it. So pray two rak'az and repent. Read Quran, give sadaqah, but move and do something to change that bad spot that you left in your heart and you left in your life. And then you will feel better and that thing will erase it. Because if you do this, then the mercy of Allah Azza wa is very close to you. In the rahmat Allah, qareebun min al muhsineen. The mercy of Allah is very close to those who are practitioner, practitioners of ihsan, who are doing ihsan. So you practice ihsan, and the mercy of Allah Azza wa is very close to you. So this man who had killed a hundred, the advice of that scholar to him is that you needed to do what? Move. And that is the advice that everybody every one of us should remember that when you cannot do something that pleases Allah Azza wa Jal or you're drowning in sin sometimes the thing that you need to do is move only then will you have the power only then will you be able to receive repentance but move from what to what move from what a place yeah move from a city 
or a location in that city or the bad friends that you have or the company that you keep or the location or the time but whatever is creating the atmosphere for that sin whatever is blocking you that needs to be removed so in the case of that man he said move so that you could improve and Allah Azza wa understood that effort. And even when your effort is not physically enough, Allah completes it and complements it. That's why the earth shrank. So that the angels of Rahmah, they could take him. Not the angels of punishment. And that tells you that Allah Azza wa wanted to be merciful with that man. But an effort had to be made. So when Allah Azza wa Jal says, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا Do not despair of Allah's mercy because Allah forgives all sins. That is an open invitation that as long as you do something for that sin to be forgiven, you are acting, you are moving, you want change, that Allah will change you and Allah will forgive you and Allah will accept your repentance. But a misunderstanding of the vast mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal and a misuse of it is to say that let me do whatever I want and Allah will forgive it. Then the question is, if that is true, who is going to populate hellfire if everybody is going to be forgiven like that? So you understand the difference between these two when we say Allah's mercy is vast but don't we need to do something to earn it? Need something to enter into that mercy to receive Allah's forgiveness rather than rely on wishful thinking on fiction on a romantic idea that somehow Allah will forgive me because somehow I am a good person Right? If that's the case, why were the prophets of Allah والسلام, afraid of Allah's punishment? Why? Right? Why is it that Adam السلام, because he ate from the tree once, he exited from heaven? Why is it that Yunus, you're ready to answer all the questions, right? <laughs> MashaAllah. Why is it that I'll give you a chance, inshallah? Why is it that Yunus alayhi salam for just leaving his people without permission once, once only, then the whale swallowed him, right? And he stayed there, and when he came out of that whale, he was frail and weak, without food, without drink, sick. And that is Allah Azza wa said that, فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ if not that he was among those who did tasbih of Allah Azza wa Jal, glorified, exonerated Allah Azza wa Jal. If not, he would have stayed inside the whale till when? The day of judgment. Right? How many thousands of years he would stay inside? For one thing. So... We always have to have a balance between believing in the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla and at the same time misusing it to say, let me do whatever I do, Allah will forgive me. Yes, it's always beautiful and it's always the case that you should always believe that Allah is merciful and that Allah is willing to receive you and take you back. And you should never cause people to despair of Allah's mercy. You know how some of us, maybe, because of how... Uh, angry we feel when Allah's laws are broken when we see haram is being committed we may believe that how is it that Allah could guide this person how Allah could Allah forgive that person so we may tend up to attend to close the door of Allah's mercy just out of anger just out of anger because of these violations right so it's important to always remember that no matter how sinful the person in front of you is you should never drive him, drive him to despair. And should always plant in his heart that Allah Azza wa Jal is very close to him if he wants to be close to Allah. And Allah could wipe all of his sins clean. All of them. Right? So in the famous hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu he said that there were two people. One of them a worshipper of Allah Azza wa Jal and another one who was sinful. And the worshipper of Allah used to advise the other one constantly, leave this sin, leave that sin. And the other person would reply and say, let me to Allah, leave me to Allah. Let this, it's between me and Allah Azza wa Jal. 
Then one of those days, that person got so angry with him, with that sinful companion of his, he says, Wallahi, Allah will never forgive you. Right? He says, Wallahi, Wallahi, Allah will never forgive you. So Allah Azza wa revealed, in another narration it says when they died, Allah revealed that, tell him, who is the one who is swearing that I will never forgive so and so? Tell them that I forgave him and invalidated your deeds. Because that is a type of sin when you close the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal in people's faces, they have no place to go except where? Downward. Because if Allah is not going to forgive me anyway, then I will do everything. Because I have nothing to lose. And they will lose hellfire, heaven for that. And that is the work of shaitan. The work of shaitan is to make you despair of Allah's mercy. To make you believe that there is no way back. Because because he is doomed, he wants to doom you as well. Drag you to hell as he is also entering it. But if you are wiser than that, as a caller to Islam, as a person who teaches it, as a person who shares Islam with others, if you are wiser than that, you will understand that the door of mercy is always open. And he said, alayhi salatu was salam, right? The door of Jannah goes all the way in width from Yemen to Asham. That's one of the gates of Jannah. It's as wide as the gate from Yemen, the distance from Yemen, all the way to Asham, where Syria is or that area. And he says, there will come a day it will be overcrowded. Right? That's one gate. And it will come a day where the gates of Jannah will be crowded. And it tells you about how many people will enter. So you want to give people the hope and the motivation and the ease of repentance. Yes, not only will Allah accept your good, uh, 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 the good that you've done, but also the bad that you've done. If you stop it, Allah will change it into good. If you stop it. So you are rich when you arrive at Allah Azza wa At the gates of mercy, at the gates of rahmah, you are rich. Like that man whom Allah Azza wa Jal on the day of judgment, sitrahu. Allah Azza wa will conceal him because that's a private conversation. فَيُقَرِّرُهُ The book of his deeds is open. And Allah will have him confess. Did you not do this? Did you not do this? Did you not do this? And these are the small sins. Not the big ones. Small sins. And that person as he's going through this process, and by the way, understand that Allah's Azza wa Jal um, discussion of the believer is not exhaustive when it comes to his sins. Right? Because the hisab is yasir. Very simple, very easy, very quick. So these are only what? The small ones. But he's having him confess. Did you not do this? Did you not do this? And the man is saying to himself, I didn't even get to the big ones. What is going to happen to me? Then Allah Azza wa Jal said to him, or will say to him, I've concealed it in the dunya, and I will forgive it in the akhirah. And change it into, what? Good deeds. I've concealed it, because even in the, in the akhirah, all this is private. No one will know about these things. He says, I've concealed it, and I'll forgive it, and I will change it into good. So the man will say, Ya Allah, but I see a lot of other sins here that we did not get to. You understand what he's saying, right? He's saying, okay, only these minor sins or all the other big sins of mine that now he wants to be exposed because now they will turn into good. So in the beginning of that discussion, he was afraid. He didn't want to see them. When Allah said they're going to be switched into good, he says, let's get them out. Right? That is the joy of repentance and that is the joy of the believer when they meet Allah Azza wa Jal. That is, you have to understand that once you turn your life around and you are close to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah loves you, then you are the best thing on this earth. You are the best. Then Allah Azza wa Jal created this earth for you and created Jannah for you. And Allah Azza wa Jal is waiting to see you. 
And Allah Azza wa is waiting to wipe your sins clean and remove all of your burdens and all of your sickness and worry and sadness and put you in Jannah. So the mercy of Allah Azza wa is so beautiful, right? Then it is greater than the mercy that your mother has for you. And the mercy that your spouse and your child has for you. Because Allah's mercy is greater than all of the mercy that they have combined and multiplied. Because he is the one who made all of that and deposited that in people's hearts. So the Prophet ﷺ, once he saw a woman and that woman was looking for her child, an infant or a toddler. And so when she saw him, right, and he was, she was afraid that on the road he's going to be trampled by animals and what have you. So she rushed to him, she held him tightly and she moved him away from harm's way. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, do you see this distressed woman? And how much she loves this child of hers? Would she ever throw him in fire? Like th just discard him in the fire? And they said, never. As long as she's able to save him, she will always save him. And never throw him away. So he said, والسلام, Allah is more merciful with his beloved, then this woman is merciful with her child. Allah is more merciful with his beloved than this woman is merciful with her child. So you could be that person that Allah Azza wa Jal loves you more than your mother loves you. And Allah takes care of you more than your mother takes care of you. And that is available to every person. Right? So the Sahaba of the Prophet والسلام, who were the best of the best, before their Islam, they did this and that. Right? But that Allah Azza wa saved them and transformed them. So you can never despair of Allah's mercy. And if the shaitan comes and tries to play with your head and say, no, this is not for you. No, you say that is exactly for me. Allah's rahmah and repentance and the shafa'ah of the Prophet والسلام, that is exactly designed for me. Right? The shaitan, every time you read the Quran and there's a sajda and you prostrate, what does he do? He cries. Why does he cry? He says, woe to me. Allah commanded me to prostrate and I did not and I will go to hell. And he commanded him to prostrate and he did and he's going to heaven. Every time that that happens. Which tells you that the shaitan knows that his plot fails. And that his plot is weak. His plot, his whispers, his reasoning, his logic is weak. It's just we accept it. But if you reject it, if you're strong enough and you can say, no, Allah Azza wa Jal can rescue me from all of this. And Allah Azza wa Jal has the power to transform me. And I can do things that could help me. Forgive all the bad that, they have, that I have done. You know, the, fast, the vast forgiveness of Allah Azza wa Jal is that He had given you every single day and every single night ways to remove your sins. From one salat to the other. When you pray Isha and Fajr. What is in between could be erased. So if you've done something bad, pray. Sadaqah erases sin. Dua erases sin. Dhikr of Allah Azza wa erases sin. If you say subhanallah wa bihamdi a hundred times, Allah removes all of your sins, even if they are as many as the bubble that you see that the waves are carrying. Meaning beyond count. Right? If you say la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu al-mulku wa lahu alhamduhu ala kulli shayin qadir a hundred times, a hundred sin goes away. And a hundred good deeds are written for you. And Allah protects you from the shaitan. For the entire day or the entire night. If you read Ayatul Kursi after each salah, the only thing that stops you from entering Jannah would be death. Right? 
So you see the chances that Allah Azza wa is giving us, the opportunities that Allah is giving to all of us for us to enter Jannah and to escape our weaknesses and escape the shaitan. So Allah Azza wa is embracing us and also Allah descends on the last third of the night. Right? If you say to yourself, I tried and I tried and I tried with this sin, I can't see him to win. What do I do? Allah Azza wa Jal descends at the last third of the night. Do you know how to calculate the last third of the night? The last third. So take Maghrib to Fajr. How many hours? Okay. Divide that by three. That will give you the thirds. Then subtract that from time of Fajr. Who, who can do the math very quickly? All the way back? Yeah, do it. Three? Two? Okay. So that's the best offer so far. Unless you can come up with a better answer. So we have two o'clock now. Huh? Four? That seems too kind of... Are you sure? Okay. Okay, so now we have two and four. I'm splitting the difference. I'm saying three. Okay, yeah? No, that's too early. Come on, guys. <laughs> we, need, we need better math. Come on, yeah? No, you're guessing now. <laughs> you're guessing. Okay, yeah. Could be, could be. I don't know the answer. I mean, I, because I don't know the times, right? You guys are looking at them. But you basically understand how to do it, right? So Maghrib all the way to Fajr. So for instance, let's say, let's say for instance, Maghrib to Fajr. Let's say that there are nine hours. Divide that by three. You get three. So you go to Fajr. And let's say Fajr is at six. Subtract three from six. You get three, right? Roughly. So that's kind of a rough answer. But so Allah Azza wa in the last third of the night, He descends, and then Allah Azza wa asks, Anybody wants to be forgiven, so I could forgive him. Anyone has a request, so I would grant them their request. So if you want anything from Allah Azza wa if your life is upside down, and you want something from Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you do what? Make dua. Make dua for tawbah, make dua for repentance, make dua for strength, make dua against that particular sin, but make dua. And the, you will find that the mercy of Allah Azza wa will get closer and closer to you. But you need to do what? Understand that it's there, understand that it is for you, and move towards it. But as long as you're sitting back and thinking somehow, someday it will come to me, Maybe before it comes, death will come. So you need to push yourself. And one of the things that we said that you should do to push yourself is dua. And anything good that you can do that is consistent. Anything. But move towards Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah Azza wa Jal said, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, if you take one step towards Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah takes two steps towards you. And if you walk towards Allah, Allah runs towards you. Right? And Allah does this though He doesn't need us. We need Him. Right? But have you ever seen a human being who does that? No matter what you do to them. Can you conceive of a human being? Think. That no matter what you do to them, as soon as you decide to walk towards them, they will run towards you. No human can do this. Even if you tell me my mother and father, I'll tell you no. Because I said no matter what you do to them. Right? Because you could do the worst towards Allah Azza wa Jal. Shirk, disbelief. Kill the ones that he loves. Kill them. Torture them. This and this and this and that. And decide to change. And walk towards Allah and Allah runs towards you. No one does that except Allah. And that is Allah's rahmah. So inshallah, let's stop here and see if you have questions. Inshallah, let me know. Even if there are online questions, so we do have the opportunity for you to ask. So the opportunity is there as long as we're sitting, inshallah. So we'll give you a few minutes, inshallah, to come up with questions. Yeah. Can shirk deprive you from entering Jannah even if what? If you read Ayatul Kursi after Salah. So 
Are we talking about the big shirk or the small shirk? Major shirk? So, a major shirk, and do, are then we talking about a person who knows about this or ignorant about it? Knows about it? So if a person knows that they're committing a major shirk, and it's major shirk in Allah Azza wa Jal, that is not forgiven. So we're assuming what? He knows that it's major shirk, he's been informed about it, he is stubborn and he rejects that advice and continues to commit that major shirk, even if the person prays. That shirk invalidates everything else. Everything else doesn't matter because it's shirk in Allah Azza wa Jal. So if a person has tawheed, he eventually enters Jannah no matter what terrible things he has done. And if a person has shirk, he enters hellfire no matter how many good things he has done. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Repeat that again. He didn't have wudu? Uh-huh. Okay, so you're praying, any salah, right? And then you remember that you don't have wudu, right? And you're sure of it. Sure of it, right? So if you are sure of it, and you're not doubtful. So if you're praying, and then you remember, hey, I didn't make wudu, and it's not just a guess, it's not just a suspicion, I know for sure I don't have wudu, you would stop. You would stop, and you go make wudu, and then you start your salah over from the beginning. Okay? Okay. Let's take a few of these questions, and then if you have any, inshallah, let me... Oh, okay. Khair, inshallah, sir. Okay. The same order. The same order. La inshallah. Okay. Okay. So as they're setting up, anybody else here who has a question? No? Okay. Okay. Hmm. Go ahead. So, Sheikh, this person asked, what do you do if you find yourself questioning the religion? Okay. So, what do you do if you find yourself questioning the religion? So, of course, it all depends on what you're questioning and how deep or fleeting these questions are. Because some of these questions that come to your mind are so baseless and so fleeting, transitory, they, they don't really stick, that it's enough to dismiss them by saying, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الله ربي لا أشرك به شيئا قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد while understanding what it means لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد it's enough to answer some of these questions because some of these questions they just come and they go as soon as they came so if it is that type of questioning that we're talking about which is that the fleeting very quick question very superficial doesn't stick and it leaves just say these things أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Seek Allah's protection from the shaitan. Say that I believe in Allah and associate none with him. I trust him, I believe him. Affirm these things and stop these thoughts and they will go away. And for most people, these thoughts will go away. So it's not wise to entertain every single idea that enters your head. Because you really don't. Have you ever thought to yourself at one point in your life, maybe I should kill a person? Yeah, you're too young. <laughs> Right? Have you ever thought about it? I'm pretty sure 99% of people thought about it, but you don't want to admit it. I, I, maybe I should kill this person. But you don't really entertain that idea. He just dismiss it. He said, this is nonsense. This is crazy. Maybe I should steal this one. But you just dismiss it because the shaitan will always throw these crazy things at you. And if you're going to entertain every idea, then you're going to spend the rest of your life just simply defending uh, insanity. So, of course, you dismiss it. So if it's just that... Ignore it. If it sticks, right? If it takes root, 
for whatever reason, right? Then you need to find an answer, right? Then you need to understand why. So sometimes the best thing to do is to take these doubts, these questions, and you go to someone who is knowledgeable and have him answer these questions. Tell me why in Islam this, 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 this. Tell me why, you know, we don't do this, but we do that. In comparison to these other ways of life, why is this is bad, but this is good? So have your questions answered. At the same time, please also deal with the reasons why these questions are coming up. Why the questioning is a questioning. Why is there a doubt? Is there a lack of practice? It's not always, by the way, intellectual. If your practice is weak, yeah, your intellect, your reasoning, but also your iman is weak enough that you will not be able to counter these claims and whispers. So if the practice is weak, yeah, and you engage in sins, and you ask, why do I have doubts? What's the answer? No. The sins. So understand also where this comes from. If you are keeping the company of those who... Uh, are suspicious of religion and you're listening to them or you're watching what you are, they're saying online and then you say I have doubts then you understand where that is coming from so understanding the reason helps you so maybe you need to increase your knowledge change course in life uh, practice religion better be more dedicated leave sins that are causing weakness and temptations and also from that doubts, change friends. All of these things are factors. But if you have questions, go to someone who can answer these questions and ask them, right? And make sure also whatever um, books you're consuming or lectures you're watching only feed your iman, not doing the opposite. So understand who is saying and what they are saying. Allahu A'lam. <clears throat> this person asked when it comes to deliberately sinning how can a person not lose sight of Allah's mercy and then they listed the examples of somebody who's an alcoholic or somebody who struggles with listening to music so as long as they are committing that sin how is it that they do not lose a sight of Allah's mercy no. yani, so the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, that said that a person committed a sin and after that, he asked Allah for forgiveness and he says, ask Allah for forgiveness. So Allah said, my servant knows that he has a Lord who forgives sins, so I've forgiven him. And he committed that sin another time. And then he said, Allah said, my servant knows that he has a Lord who forgives sins, so I've forgiven him. And then he committed that same sin a third time. And then Allah Azza wa Jal said, my servant knows that he has a Lord who forgives sins, I've forgiven him, do whatever you want. Meaning, do whatever you want is what? It's not a blank check to say, go. It's as if you are, as long as you're asking for forgiveness, you are forgiven. So if a person is an alcoholic, let's say, right? And he's struggling with alcohol, and it is an addiction, and it's really hard to give up on an addiction. I mean, to, to, to kind of quit any sort of addiction, that is a struggle. So we got to also sympathize, not be, be judgmental all the time. You got to sympathize with somebody who is trapped and it's hard for him to escape that trap. But we're saying to them, as long as you are trying, you're close to Allah's mercy, even if you fail. What we want from you is to always come back is to always ask Allah for forgiveness, is to always keep trying. And as long as you're asking for forgiveness, one of those times is going to work for you. Right? One of those days, that's going to work for you. Right? And you'll be fine for a month, or fine for a year, or fine for a day. Allah is witnessing your jihad, and what you're doing is jihad. What you're doing is jihad. Allah rewards you for it. And He understands more than any one of us. He understands your struggle. Understands the weakness. Understands the gravity of that struggle. So trust in Allah Azza wa Jal and never give up on yourself. That's what I will say. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. So this person asked, how do you build yaqeen in Allah when making dua? How do you build yaqeen in Allah Azza wa Jal when making dua? You need to know Allah Azza wa Jal better. 
right? And the best way to know Allah Azza wa Jal better is through the Quran and Sunnah, meaning read the Quran to understand who Allah is. To start feeling that Allah Azza wa is around you all the time. As you are walking, He's with you. When you sit, He's with you. When you speak, He's listening to you. So understanding Allah Azza wa through your ibadah, especially through the Quran and through your sujood and through your um, dhikr of Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and through what the Prophet والسلام, said in the sunnah, this is how you feel that Allah is there and Allah is around you, close to you. And then when you hear from the Prophet ﷺ when he said, make dua while you have certainty in Allah's answer, you can have certainty because you know who Allah is. You've been talking to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel him around you, close to you. You, all, he, you always, when you want to do something or say something, you always are aware of him witnessing whatever you are doing. And then you trust him because of all of this, When my servants ask you about me, I am close answering the supplication of the supplicator. So you believe him because you're close to him. And then when you make dua, you believe in that. And then say to yourself, Allah Azza wa Jal is the most generous. And he did not facilitate and enable me to make dua except because he wants to accept that from me. Otherwise, why would he enable me to raise my hands and ask? Just like, right? Think of a king. And people are lining up in front of his palace. And the door is closed. And people are not allowed to enter. And then the door opens and you're summoned inside. Why are you asked inside? Because you expect what? That there is good that is going to follow. The king allowed me in because he wants to give me something. Otherwise, why would he allow you in? So when Allah Azza wa lets you make dua, it means he wants to give you. That's like being summoned. That should restore hope and certainty. Allah yeah. So this person here has asked, for advice on leaving a major sin for the sake of Allah because of major guilt, but then desiring and wanting to get back to doing that major sin after leaving it fully and no. then going back to it again. No. Of course, always, it's not the issue is not going back to it. The issue is feeling desperate because you go back to it. These are two things. You say, it's always going to be a struggle. It's always going to be a struggle when one, with one thing or the other. Right? So as long as, right, as long as when you commit it, you feel guilty, then that's good. You feel terrible about what you have done. And then you say to yourself, I don't want to go back to that feeling again. I don't want to go back to that sin again. And you decide to quit, then that's great. Even if you go back to it later, but that feeling is necessary. But if you want advice on how to overcome it, so remember this. First of all, consistent dua all the time. To keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time, especially at the times where dua is being accepted. Last hour on Friday, last third of the night, in your sujood, when it's raining, after the salah, asking your parents to make dua for you, making dua when you're traveling, when you're sick, but making dua and making it a daily habit. It's like making this an obsession, like an obsession. I have this and I need to quit it. Ya Allah, Ya Allah, consistently pleading with him, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya, and you keep making that dua. So you plead with urgency and you keep repeating on and on and on and on. So dua. Second, establish your salah. Because when the advice of the ulama is said that if you want strength, strengthen your iman to be able to combat that sin. Because what gives it strength distance from Allah Azza wa Jal and the space that the shaitan has to whisper. So strengthen your iman 
and strengthen the influence of the angels of Allah Azza wa because the angels of Allah have influences on you. They do direct you, they do guide you. So establish your salah on regular basis. Concentrate, be aware of what you're saying. Dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, more. Populate your time with more dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. Astaghfirullah all the time. Alhamdulillah all the time. You know, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah all the time. So do a lot of dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then change the spot, the time, or the space, or the people that encourages that sin. You know, right, what leads to it. You understand. Now, once you put your foot on that, that, they take the first step here, the rest is a foregone conclusion. You know you're going to end up there. You know. If I pass through this, or open this, or listen to this person, the next step will be I'm committing that sin. So you know what leads to it. So put a barrier between you and that thing. Don't be alone. Don't surf uh, on your own. Don't be alone with your phone. Don't be in that spot. Don't be with that person. Don't talk to that person. Be with somebody else during this time, that critical time where you always commit that sin. And when you are among the righteous or at least among other people, you're less likely to commit something that is disgraceful. So put barriers between you and that sin. And keep struggling. And keep trying. And again we say, one of those days it will work, inshallah. <clears throat> so this person asked How can we rely on Allah's mercy Without taking advantage of it How can we rely on Allah's mercy Without taking advantage of it If you find yourself Righteous While relying on Allah's mercy Trying while relying on Allah's mercy Then you're on the right path If you're finding yourself Sinful uh, Cavalier about Allah's prohibition relying then on Allah's mercy that one day somehow I'll be forgiven, then you are a person who is abusing it. So it depends on you. It really depends on you. If you are doing something to please Allah Azza wa Jal, then you have hope in Allah's mercy because you're doing something. If you're not doing a thing at all, hoping somehow you're going to receive it, then you are deluding yourself. That is the distinction. And that's why we are saying, no matter how terrible you are, right, keep a connection between you and Allah. Don't sever that connection. And then grow it each single day, because obviously you're not happy with yourself. You're obviously not the person that you want to be. And obviously you'd be so ashamed if Allah were to take your soul at this moment. Or if people were to find out what you were doing. And you, do wanna once, you don't want to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal in that way. You know this very well. So before that happens, whatever connection you have with Allah Azza wa Jal that we said should be established, grow it to an extent that possibly it could help you escape your lifestyle. Yeah, Allah Azza So this person says that they have trouble staying concentrated during Salah. And they ask, how can they engage better and be less mechanical with their salah? So if you understand the meaning behind salah, so if you understand kind of the supplications in them or the dhikr that is in them and what it means, understand what you're reading in the Qur'an, understand the purpose of that movement, why is there a ruku'ah, why is there a sujood? And of course we can't kind of go through this. Uh, if you understand what the salah can do for you, all the things that it could do for you, how it's the main connection you have to Allah Azza wa Jal, how it is the thermometer for the rest of the day, right? It determines how good or how bad your relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal is. It's the metric for the entire day. That if you put an effort, then the rest of the day is great. And if not, then you will lose it. That it is the major cleansing, right, ritual that changes you and allows you to connect with Allah Azza wa Jal. And, 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 and. So if you invest time and if you ask Allah Azza wa Jal for khushu' and concentration and try to dismiss in your salah, right? You know how one of the things that I liked to in terms of advice 
Whenever you start your salah, you start to think about all the other things that you're supposed to do. Right? I need to take care of this and I need to take care of that. I need to talk to someone. There's this urgent call, this urgent this, this urgent that. It's like everything just attacks you at that moment just to distract you. And one beautiful advice was that the thing that you want, if you're thinking about and you're worried about, all these things can be attained if you just concentrate in your salah, not away from it. You understand what I mean? That if you're worried about my exam, my family, my this and that, what will happen to this? It says, if you dismiss these thoughts in the salah and ask Allah Azza wa Jal for help and support, all the things that you are worried about, you will be able to attain. Right? So this salah helps you get everything that you want, but the shaitan brings all these worries. You say, dismiss these worries during that time and concentrate on it and whatever you want Allah will give to you whatever you're worried about Allah will protect you from you want to add something? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So vary, your advice is vary the surahs that you are reading. So it's not just simply an expected recitation, but it's something different that you could relate to. Barakallah, and we can say also you could switch the other adhkar in the salah. So the tashahud can be switched also, the uh, tasbih in the ruku, the tasbih in the sujood, that also can be switched so that you're not really, it's not a monotonous um, repetition. And then? Okay, so you want to stop? After Salah? So we've been praying at 45, right? Or you want to pray immediately? 8.30 or 8.45? Okay. Nistanna? Kamil, wait. Okay, continue with the questions. Okay, khalas. Okay, continue. So this person asked, are your ah. tests... So this person asked, are your tests and trials in this dunya a consequence of your sins? What advice would you give to someone who's experiencing extreme worries and anxiety? So what advice would you give to someone who's experiencing extreme worries and anxiety? First of all, I mean, that may not be necessarily a bad thing. If you're going through extreme worries, sadness, depression, and anxiety, it means that something is wrong. And knowing or feeling that something is wrong allows you to fix it. The problem would be is that if you say, I'm so happy with this life, I see nothing's wrong with it. That's the problem. That's a cause cause for concern. So if that's the case, you know then, then you need to change something about your life. Then move closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Right? And then you may need to talk to someone and I mean by that someone who is religious who will be able to give you advice on what is causing that worry, anxiety, sadness, where it's coming from, how to treat it. Uh, rely on the Qur'an and not just mere recitation. Rely on understanding what Allah Azza wa Jal is telling you and is teaching you. So educate yourself, read more. Read more of the Sunnah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. And it depends on the severity of that ailment that you're describing. Some of it is really severe that you really need to talk to someone and they need to guide you through all of that. Some of it is not as severe and you're able to um, find your way through whatever ayahs and whatever hadith you are reading or Islamic books. So overall I would say, yes, this is a cause of our shortcomings, all these anxieties that we are feeling, but also consider that it could be a prodding a push from Allah Azza wa Jal for you to move towards Him. Because when you're physically ill, you go to see a doctor, right? When you then ill spiritually, where do you go? Towards Allah Azza wa Jal. So if it's pushing you towards Allah, then that in itself is good. You just need to find answers for why you're feeling these ways and treatments for the past causes. So talk to someone about it, but also let that push you closer to Allah. And again, 
Dua and dhikr, dua and dhikr, dua and dhikr. Keep doing this. Surah Al-Baqarah also is great. So recite more of the Quran and specifically Surah Al-Baqarah so that Allah Azza wa can bring this calm and barakah into your house and into your uh, surroundings. Allah. So this person asked, what's the difference between istighfar and tawbah and how do you perform each? So istighfar could be the same as tawbah or istighfar could be the different, different from tawbah. Istighfar is simply as, Ya Allah forgive me this. And may not be the same as tawbah. Tawbah could be what is what? I'm going to stop this. Right? Tawbah, I'm stopping this. I'm not going back to it. Istighfar, Ya Allah forgive this. And they could be joined or could be separate. Is that clear? Okay. And you see how we could perform both? So it's exactly as I said. The best of it is istighfar with tawbah. Ya Allah, forgive me this. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah alladhi la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum wa atubu ilayh. So this is istighfar. With the intention of, I regret what I've done, I'm not going back to it. That's tawbah. And fulfilling all the conditions of tawbah. So that's the best. Independently, tawbah is, I'm done with this. Istighfar, ya Allah, forgive that. So this person asked, how does one know when Allah has forgiven them and is pleased with them? And what are some of the signs? How do you know when Allah Azza wa had forgiven you? With certainty, he would not know. Which is a good thing. Because then you'll always be worried about that sin. But a good sign, okay, a good sign is that you change. You become a better person, right? You stop that thing. You move, you move beyond it. But for you to know for sure that Allah had forgiven, unless there is revelation, how would you know? So you wouldn't know. But you always remain hopeful. And also fearful, and that's why when you remember that sin, what do you do? You renew your tawbah, you make more istighfar, and you do something good. And this is how, in part, how Allah changes every bad into good. Because every time you remember it, you do something good because of it. Allah I want to see like how, how, many, how many do we have? Okay, I want to see how brief I should to be in answering these questions. Okay. Okay. So speed round, huh? Mm -hmm. So this person said, please speak about kids hesitating to learn Quran. So I think they're asking, yani, what are some steps they could take towards pushing their kids the so how, how do you motivate your kids to, to learn the Quran? Um, be, first, be, be the example. Be the example. Like let them see you sitting and reading the Quran and learning it. And also maybe become their partner in it. Like if you have not been doing it for a while, if they're learning a surah, learn a surah with them. So you become their companion. Or you're, you're memorizing this, I'll memorize it as well. Or you know what, maybe I've memorized it, but what I'm going to do is I'll read the tafsir. I'll share that with you. So it becomes an activity between father and son or between mother and daughter or what have you. But that's a way to motivate. It's an activity, right? Or when you come back home, you finish memorizing this, we're going to make an activity out of this, right? And you be creative. So if it's a, it has a story, you kind of write out the story or, you know, create it and then discuss it or make a contest or a quiz based on it and give them rewards based on answering these questions. So make it something that is attractive, something that is fun. And then in addition of course, you know, tell them always about the rewards that they will get from Quran memorization. But as kids, I don't know how much of that is gonna stick. What's gonna stick is you participating in that activity as well with them. So this person here, they actually have two different questions. Hmm. So the first question is, <clears throat> when we lose the loved one, are they able to hear everything after they're buried? And can they hear us when we mention them in du'as? So when you lose a loved one, are they able to hear everything after their death? So immediately after, when they are being buried, just put in the ground for a period of, I don't know, 10 to 15 minutes, they're aware of the footsteps around them. They're aware of the company around them. And that's why... It is said in the, either it's a hadith or an athar that remain 
for as long as a camel is being slaughtered until I will be able to answer the questions in the grave. So they're aware of, they say, They'll be able to hear the footsteps okay, of people around. After that, Wallahu a'lam, the connection between them and the living is disconnected, is lost. So they're not aware of who comes to visit the grave or if they give salam to them or whatever. So they're not aware. They're not aware of what happens on earth. Okay, they're disconnected from it. Are they aware of a person who makes dua for them? We have a hadith that tells us that a person in, he'll be in Jannah, meaning he's dead, but it's not yet the day of judgment, at one level in, in Jannah, and then he'll be raised. And he say, Ya Allah, by what did I deserve that elevation? He says, because of the supplication of your son. Right? Because of the supplication of your son. So there is that kind of awareness that Allah Azza wa communicates to them. They don't know by themselves, somebody tells them. No. So this second question that the person asked is with regards to the Salah. So they asked, if you forget to pray Dhuhr and remember that you forgot to pray Dhuhr at Maghrib, are you still able to pray and will it count? So if you forgot to pray Dhuhr? So it was by the time it came to the time of Maghrib, that's when they remembered they forgot to pray Dhuhr. Okay, then they pray it immediately. Whatever prayer you forgot to pray, you pray it as soon as you remember it, in the order, right, of Dhuhr first. So it's time for, you'll say, you forgot Dhuhr, you prayed Asr, time for Maghrib, then you remembered I didn't pray Dhuhr, you pray Dhuhr, and then pray Maghrib. So this person asked, how can I stop a sin that I keep coming back to? It's a cycle, I make sincere toba, and still find myself one to three months later returning to that same sin. So we've, we've talked about this and we said, we said dua and consistently keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and support. Uh, increase your piety, increase your ibadah, increase your dhikr and know that it's a struggle and understand, be a savvy right, Muslim, a believer, understand how you get to commit that sin, how the shaitan tricks you, what we call the footsteps of the shaitan, how he tricks you and then block these ways. And eventually, insha'Allah, you'll be able to overcome it. So this person asked, do the people who have committed major sins go straight to Jahannam right away? Or does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala read their major sins out to them? So the people who commit major sins, do they go directly to Jahannam? No, no. Because a person, even though they commit major sins, they can still never enter Jannah, uh, never enter Jahannam, and they enter Jannah. So there's a process of what? Process of evaluating what they have done. So they committed major sins, but maybe they've done more, bad, more good than bad. Maybe some of these major sins will be forgiven because of a dua or an intercession or somebody's uh, sadaqah or dua for them. There are reasons for these major sins to be forgiven or overlooked in relation to other good things that have been done. So we don't say if they committed major sins directly to hellfire, no. There's still a process of evaluating what they have done in relation to other things as well. Just let me know. If you want me to stop, I'll stop, inshallah. Should I stop or one more? So, inshallah, okay. we're going to conclude with one more question. Okay, inshallah. <laughs> Someone said, I heard whistling is used to call out to the jinn. Is this true? What is it? Whistling. No. Whistling calls the jinn. No. That was quick, so we can take another one. No. It's an improper act, yes, but that it, there's no evidence that that is a thing that summons the jinn. No. Okay, so this person asked, what's the ruling on praying in a room with faces? As in, I'm assuming they mean pictures. That, like pictures of people. The, the, the salah, yani the salah is valid. It doesn't invalidate the salah. So what type of pictures, which is just innocent kind of pictures, not religious, right? So I'm assuming maybe like pictures of people, like family or certain, certain individuals. Oh, okay, okay. 
It doesn't affect the salah. The salah itself is, is valid, right? Uh, but not recommended, uh, and it's not a good idea, right, to have pictures hanging. So it's always, always, always a good idea for a lot of reasons we're not going to go into, right, to remove all these things, right? Because you want the malaika to do what? Be in the room, to enter the house. So remove those pictures. There is no really any necessity for them to be hanging. So keep them somewhere else. That makes your salah better, your concentration better. The angels enter. Because if you deny the angels entry into your room or house, who enters? Yeah, so the jinn enter it. So you don't want that to be your company. So remove all these pictures, inshallah. Put them in an album, put them in a, a drawer, put them somewhere away. And leave your room, inshallah, clean. And that way your salah will be better, inshallah. You want to ask a question? Sure, okay. So how, many ta- how much time does he spend in hellfire if he did bad things? Only Allah knows. That's a simple answer, right? Because no one really knows how much time a person could spend in hellfire except the one who judges him and knows exactly how good and bad he is. So only Allah Azza wa Jal knows that. Alhamdulillah. Should we stop? Yeah, so Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. We have about five, six more questions. Okay. So I think we'll continue after Salah, inshallah. Inshallah, طيب. Zakallah, subhanakallah, bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha, and astaghfiruka, tuburi.